All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final quarterly meeting of the year, and thanks for joining us. Uh, today, we plan to provide a little bit of a roadmap that touches on where we've been and where we're going in terms of the regional housing needs and a strategy to drive solutions to our housing crisis. Uh, with an unveiling of a draft regional uh, housing implementation plan as well, which we'll seek your feedback and input on by discussing together as a group. By the end of the meeting, we we're really hoping that as a collective, we can walk away with some concrete ideas on what's next for us uh, as a region. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and put up a glimpse of our uh, TTCF's programs, just so that, just for anyone who hasn't seen these slides before, although I know most of you have, um, as well as a list of partners for anyone who doesn't know who we are. And finally, uh, Mountain Housing Council's meeting agreements. Again, I know most of you have seen these already, um, but we try to do this at the beginning of all of our meetings just to remind folks to be respectful of each other's opinions and feel free to, to chat with us, uh, use either sending me a direct chat uh, if I don't see your hand raised or posting it in the uh, chat box for everyone. Um, and sorry, in the vein of truth transparency, we added a few slides <laughs> to the slide deck. And just to introduce uh, Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation's board and staff. And so, um, are you able to see my screen? And we'll just go through these slides really quick. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. So, I guess just because it's the last meeting of the year, we're going to just kind of go through a list of board of directors uh, and our staff as well. Um, just so folks are also familiar with, with all of those individuals as well. Um, we do have quite a few new staffers um, on board. Um, we have um, a new chief operating and finance officer, a new chief philanthropy officer. Um, we have a new Force Futures program director and uh, a director of impact investing as well. So a lot of new staff at TTCF, very, very exciting times. All right, so here's just a glimpse of our agenda and kind of where we're going today and how much time everything's gonna, gonna have. Um, we, we tried to kind of mix things up a little bit just because we've got the unveiling of the draft regional housing implementation plan. Um, so we won't have some community storytellers at the beginning of the meeting. We're really gonna focus on discussing the plan with you and kind of getting your input and feedback uh, more towards the end of the meeting instead. Uh, so just to give you a heads up on that. All right, so with that, we're gonna launch right into kind of a recap of what happened at our July 23rd meeting and kind of some of the important action items and next steps that came out of that. Um, and thanks to all of you who've been providing your feedback uh, since then uh, on various items, such as uh, the definition of achievable and our, our updating of that, uh, as well as the emergency proclamation that we agreed to pursue uh, as a group of partners, as opposed to regional jurisdictions. Um, so as I mentioned, one of those important action items was revisiting the definition of achievable local housing uh, in light of the new data that came out of our housing needs assessment, as well as building in the ability to kind of automatically have new housing assessments that are hopefully done every year uh, reflected in this concept of achievable. Uh, since, as you all well know, uh, what is and is not affordable in our region in terms of uh, area medium income is constantly changing based upon a number of factors. So we considered all the feedback that we received and also included language allowing local jurisdictions to determine how to implement the concept of achievable local housing in their own area in order to provide as much flexibility as possible. Um, so that's just kind of a quick glimpse of the final definition. Um, again, I can circulate that to anyone who's interested, but it incorporated any feedback that we received from all of you. And again, thank you for that. Um, it's much appreciated and it's very helpful. Um, we also discussed at our last meeting, uh, Mountain Housing Council moving forward with its own emergency proclamation and some of the benefits that could come from making this statement as a group, uh, namely bringing more attention to the acute crisis our region is facing to leaders and others outside of our region who may not be aware of it uh, in, in an effort to bring about more results such as assistance and access, uh, access to federal and state land uh, in order to potentially put in place some kind of maybe rapid response temporary housing uh, and looking beyond just the summer and keeping attention focused on this crisis and how important that is, uh, which obviously isn't going, going away anytime soon. 
Uh, as one partner put it, obtaining some cooperation with putting putting in place some measures to prevent us from all being victims of, of housing loss every time the market heats up. So this slide shows the process that we use to craft the proclamation and then partners weighed in with questions and suggestions, but overall supported moving forward with the declaration in order to continue to spread awareness of the crisis in our region is facing. <clears throat> so on, on that note, I just kind of want to remind folks that this is something we committed we committed to kind of reminding, putting out reminders of even beyond our summer emergency planning to kind of continue to do, uh, to bring attention to the crisis and remind people that it's still very much around in spite of all of the progress that our partners are regularly making. So in addition to our emergency proclamations, there were several other action items that came out of our summer emergency planning. Um, and our summer emergency meeting and have continued to move and our partners have made progress on. Um, so we've got a list of some of those important items that came out of it. Um, and these are not only programs that our partners started on, you know, back at the inception of Mountain Housing Council, but over the last four months have made significant pro progress on, even without the jurisdictions declaring any kind of emergency, which is quite impressive. Um, Number one, continuing to expand on providing financial and regulatory incentives and increasing our inventory of long-term rentals through programs such as Landing Locals. Uh, Landing Locals, as you all know, was started in Truckee, but has since expanded to incorporate Placer County as well. Uh, and Truckee recently expanded its existing program to increase incentives and include room rentals, which is really exciting. Um, we also discussed some rapid response temporary housing. This included some safe parking programs. Uh, the Supportive Housing and Homelessness Working Group followed up on that recommendation by looking uh, more closely into pallet shelters and kind of available land where we could possibly put those. Um, so right now we are currently exploring some property locations in the region as well as funding opportunities with the state of California for some of these programs. Another item was removing limits on camping and RV occupancy on private property inside jurisdictions. Uh, Placer and Nevada counties are currently re-examining these ordinances as they are outdated and or they informed us that they are outdated and require regular monitoring. And so it made sense um, also for them to revisit the ordinances as well. So that's another really good um, outcome that came out of our emergency planning. Um, allowing tiny homes to remain on wheels and within jurisdiction limits was another important action item. Uh, Placer, Nevada, and Truckee do allow tiny houses on wheels in RV and mobile home parks, as you all well know, as well as on private property for a specific amount of time. Uh, in addition, in order to diversify the type and affordability of housing, the Placer County Planning Department just proposed to amend the zoning ordinance to add tiny houses to wheels as another housing option, and that was on October 7th. And the Placer County Board of Supervisors will consider these recommendations at their next hearing in November. A moratorium and caps and or caps on short-term rentals was another outcome. Um, as you, most of you probably know, Placer County and Truckee now have moratoriums on no, new short-term rental permits. So that's another action item that moved very quickly. A mobile home conversion ordinance to protect residents if, there are, if parks change hands and preserving existing affordable units was another item that was identified. Um, it is important here to note that Nevada County is pursuing a rent space stabilization ordinance for county parks, which will be brought to the board in January of 2022 and include official work done by, market, by a market research firm. In most cases, a temporary ordinance is put in place followed by a permanent solution uh, in these types of cases. Uh, in order to implement any measures outside of county parks, though the California Department of Housing Community Development has to get involved as that's their jurisdiction. Prioritizing deed restricted projects is also another really important uh, program that, um, that our jurisdictions were already kind of looking into and pursuing, but was also something prioritized out of our emergency planning. Uh, Placer County, as you know, has put in place the Workforce Housing Preservation Program, and Truckee is moving forward with its below market rate program. So that's really exciting. Funding third-party reviews of accessory dwelling unit applications was another priority that was identified. Um, this is something that Truckee is doing, uh, and Nevada County actually has retained a third-party contractor to assist with as well. Um, in addition, it's important to note that the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency Governing Board approved several new rules that will allow California homeowners to build ADUs in the basin. So that's another really important step that was taken. 
Uh, incentive programs to convert vacant housing into local workforce housing. Uh, Truckee expanded its landing locals grants for homeowners, as I mentioned, and its overall program to not only include homes, but room rentals. Uh, Mountain Housing Council is also exploring additional potential to open up even more existing housing opportunities when it comes to uh, homes, vacant second homes. Tax increment financing tools, temporary rent control caps. These are other um, important items that were identified by the group. Um, and in this capacity, it is important to note that there is a, a law called the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act that does preempt local rent control ordinances in, in a number of ways. And this does prevent localities from regulating rents in single family homes, condos, or apartments that were built after 1995. Um, but on the other hand, AB 1482 from last year did enact some statewide tenant protections, uh, limiting rent increase to no more than 5% per year in some capacities and some uh, rental units. Uh, so that's just a really kind of very quick glimpse at some of the progress our partners have made basically over the last four, four months, um, which is quite impressive, um, especially since they did all of this without uh, declaring an emergency. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Brittany Benisi with the Sierra Business Council to provide us with an update on statewide policy working groups, as there's been some legislation that has been signed into law at the state level that's expected to have a significant effect on the statewide housing crisis. Thank you, Tara. Uh, it does. I am Brittany Benisi, but I wanted to note that um, for all those noting the promotion I got on this slide, don't worry, Steve Frisch is still the president of Sierra Business Council. Uh, I am our government and community affairs director. It's great to be with everyone this morning. Uh, we can go ahead and jump off to the next slide. Um, I want to highlight the uh, wonderful members of our policy working group. We work together to uh, identify opportunities and take action on state policies that impact our achievable housing landscape. Uh, this is a really engaged group and we are always open to new members. Uh, so please uh, feel free to be in touch with uh, Christina or myself following today's meeting if you'd be interested in how you can get involved. Uh, next slide. Uh, so before I dig into some of this year's key housing policy outcomes, uh, let's revisit the major policy objectives that the working group adopted at the start of the year. Uh, so we uh, agreed as a group that we wanted to um, build political identity and influence for the Mountain Housing Council outside of the region. Uh, we aim to support a permanent or minimum uh, one-year solution to, to the California eviction moratorium amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we aim to support the governor's housing actions as articulated in his January proposed budget. And as always, uh, we aim to change or remove policy barriers to implementing achievable housing in the Tahoe Truckee region. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of outcomes, we're pleased to say that we made pretty good headway in each of our objectives over the past year. Uh, we have built political identity and influence uh, with major statewide housing coalitions, including uh, Housing Now, uh, Cal Yimby, and the Coalition uh, for Rural Housing of California, which also provided us with leverage in advocacy efforts uh, that we focus, focused on, such as the eviction moratorium. We also gained recognition from several legislative uh, leaders uh, for our diversity and membership sectors, um, including our local government, real estate, and community leader partners, um, combined with the balanced approach that we took towards uh, the policy positions that we did take. Um, it was great to see those recognized by some of our uh, state senators and assembly members. With regard to the eviction moratorium, we saw it first extended through June and then uh, through September, directly advocating for the needs of our region's renters and property owners. Uh, we may not have seen the full one-year uh, moratorium extension that we had hoped to see, uh, but this summer's deal did include funding to backfill all missed rent and utility payments tied to the pandemic, um, helping tenants catch up on missed payments and backfilling lost revenue. Uh, for property owners impacted by the moratorium. And while the moratorium's deadline may have passed on September 30th, um, it should be noted that tenants uh, have until March 2022 to apply for rental and back payment assistance. 
Uh, next, thanks to a historic state revenue surplus uh, and significant federal funding tied to uh, COVID recovery, an unprecedented budget for new housing um, and the tackling of the homelessness crisis was signed by the governor uh, earlier uh, this past summer. This package includes historic funding for affordable housing development and preservation, uh, rural funding set-asides in housing grant programs, uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, financing for accessory dwelling unit, uh, and funding for the conversion of motels uh, to uh, for housing for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, finally, following thoughtful discussion um, and a uh, number of proposed policies, we weighed in on several significant pieces of legislation over the legislative session, uh, two of which you may have seen make the national news. Uh, many members of the Mountain Housing Council Policy Working Group supported both SB 9 and SB 10. Um, and as I said, not without robust discussion about the uh, the pros and any potential drawbacks to each of these bills uh, for our community. Uh, so Senate Bill 9 allows for single family zone parcels to be split into two uh, with up to two residential units contained on each parcel. Uh, SB 10 allows for greater density in transit rich or jobs rich areas uh, as defined by the state. Both of these bills will take effect uh, January 1st, 2022, um, and will basically make it easier for Californians to build on uh, to build more than one housing unit um, on many properties that for decades have been reserved exclusively for single family homes uh, and will also give cities greater flexibility uh, to place small apartment complexes in neighborhoods near public transit. Uh, to reiterate with regard to um, the zoning changes involved, um, multifamily housing will now be allowed on parcels previously limited to single family zoning, uh, but in uh, limited to, to up to four units uh, per parcel. And in practice, uh, their impact of the zoning changes will largely be indirect to the Tahoe Truckee region um, through increased housing inventory in California's more urban areas. Uh, with little anticipated impact on parcels in our communities. Local governments uh, also still have uh, some discretion as to what gets approved. And uh, in terms of SB 10, the state's definitions of transit-rich and jobs-rich areas largely exclude our region. Other policies that we focused on in this session uh, surrounded a growing discourse on development in the wildland urban interface, uh, how to ensure we're not increasing wildfire risk while addressing uh, the state's housing crisis. We worked with partners in the forestry and environmental communities um, to reduce the chances of a full moratorium on development in the housing, uh, in a full moratorium on development in uh, the wildland urban interface. Um, and we did this really strategically by increasing support uh, for a more balanced approach that was introduced um, as a separate bill, uh, which I can discuss more on the next slide when we look at what's ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, so balancing wildfire risk reduction with housing inventory needs is going to be an ongoing discussion in the Capitol. Uh, this past year, we supported a bill that would have required safety element updates for any new developments, uh, along with wildfire risk analysis for existing developments, an approach that, um, that the policy working group recognized as, um, as balanced in helping to reduce our community's wildfire risk while still allowing uh, for the approval of new residential development. We expect this bill, um, which uh, was SB 12 in this past session from Senator McGuire of um, Hillsburg, uh, to be brought back, as well as other bills that may counter our balanced approach, such as the, the full moratorium. Uh, so it's something that we're going to be watching very, very clearly and um, are currently in contact with Senator McGuire's office uh, to ensure that the Mountain Housing Council's policy working group input is considered uh, with any new bill language that may get added uh, when reintroduced next year. Uh, other areas um, that we may be folks that we'll likely be focusing on um, include potential for, uh, for reform to our uh, state's California Fair Plan. Um, the California Insurance Commissioner uh, has signaled support for reforming uh, our wildfire insurance of last resort, um, of which I'm sure many of us are all, feel, all too familiar with. 
uh, by increasing coverage or reducing costs for property owners who take it upon themselves to increase uh, home hardening on their property, reduce, reducing their property's wildfire risk. Uh, we'll be closely tracking how this potential reform develops and, again, any policies that may count, come out to, um, to counter it uh, or to use insurance to further limit uh, potential for development in the uh, WUI. Then increased infill housing density, um, unsurprisingly, will continue to be a major focus um, of decision makers and we'll be tracking uh, policies and processes introduced uh, to take on um, increased housing density. And then we're also hearing a lot of potential for updates to, uh, to state funding program guidelines, um, including the Affordable Housing Sustainable Community Grant Guidelines. Uh, in order to meet our state's net zero uh, carbon goals, the state is looking at incentives uh, for carbon neutral building development. Uh, so we'll be tracking potential changes to funding sources um, and guidelines that give higher scores to carbon neutral plans. Uh, then lastly, it should be noted that all of these items uh, are in the very early stages. There is a lot of discussion and in the Capitol, they keep a lot close to chest. Um, so a lot of these could get, uh, could see shifts over the next two months, but we'll be um, keeping our ears to the ground and tracking uh, expectations for 2022 very closely. Um, a clearer picture will be, uh, will be drawn by our next uh, meeting of the policy working group. Uh, which we can jump to the next slide, Christina. Uh, which, speaking of, again, um, if anyone would be interested in learning more about the policy working group activities, uh, please join us on November 22nd uh, for our next meeting where we will be uh, digging into priorities and opportunities uh, for the coming legislative session that will kick off in January 2022. That's all for me. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thanks, Brittany. Do anyone have any questions for Brittany? Okay, great. Heidi, did you wanna go ahead and provide a uh, update for housing funders? Yeah, great, thank you. Hi everybody, it's Heidi Alstead with the Martis Fund. Good to see everybody on this cold and windy Friday. Um, so the Housing Funders Network is a group of local funders and resource partners that play a role in financially supporting our local achievable housing projects. The goal is to align our resources and processes, and as well as seek funding from outside agencies and to grow donor resources as well. Uh, the members include Placer County, Truckee Tahoe Workforce Housing Agency, the Town of Truckee, Martis Fund, and TTCF. Next slide, please. So our charter is really, you know, to create funders that support uh, achievable local housing projects in our region. So, so basically when we get together, we're looking at existing alignment of project coordination. So this is a great place for us to get together and talk about a particular project uh, at the same table instead of having lots of different conversations on the side going to come together and really, really, you know, dive into those projects. Um, we are also looking at, you know, documenting procedural standards for developers so we can give them some support when they apply and say like, you know, we, you have, you have to fill out this form in this way or provide a poor forma. Um, and we're, the goal is also to leverage and attract resources um, and then also report and capture stories and successes and also challenges which we have faced as well. Um, how, do, how do we measure success and align our process? So we developed a one point of entry for developers so we can capture everything in one place and track it and come back to it if we need to. Um, we're looking at supporting a diverse range of applicants and projects since we all have different funding criteria at the table, um, but also looking at leveraging existing resources, but again, attracting more funds, maybe outside of the area or state and federal funds uh, to create more housing opportunities. And then we also look at those stuck projects that we've you probably heard us talk about before, about, you know, why are they stuck? Are they entitled? And, and how do we get them unstuck? So with the support of this group. So that's always on our agenda as well. Next slide, please. So our criteria that we have when people uh, submit the inquiry form, um, we really ask that the projects are already entitled. Although we do look at projects, you know, that are in, still in the beginning stages to discuss them and 
and help them kind of move along. But really, we would like them to be entitled to uh, to get funding. Um, any other inquiry should go to someone else, maybe at the town or with SBC, you know, for technical assistance. And then again, you know, the stuck projects, we we're always looking at those to see how we can get those moved forward. So basically, the criteria that we provide uh, the applicants is, you know, one is the project possible. Um, does it fit within our funding criteria? Have they included a pro forma so we can right off the bat see what those costs and expenses are going to be? Have the entitlements been in place? It's a critical question. All of us have different AMI categories, so we're always looking at that to make sure it's in alignment with our current funding strategies. And then, you know, is there a local workforce uh, priority within their project? And is the project shovel ready? Is it ready? Is it basically ready to go? Next slide, please. So attracting additional resources, we have all of our partners at the table, but what we're also trying to do is to you know, increase TTCF's housing solutions funds. So we can get those projects out the door, also increasing or looking at state and federal capital to, to really get these projects off the ground. Next slide, please. A couple projects that we looked at this a uh, couple weeks ago, uh, one project, uh, it's an affordable housing project and already has a commitment of $800,000, possibly up to a million, but also has sought a, an additional million dollars from local partners. And, you know, in order to be competitive for those tax credits, they, they need to have already committed, received a commitment from other uh, funders to go for those tax credits. Another proposal that we looked at was a seasonal workforce housing project um, that apparently displaced some locals. Um, there were no commitments from partners at this time, and one of our partners denied a previous request. And this is an example of a great way that we are working together during these meetings to see who's talked to whom and, and what are the details that we've heard and, and if it's different, et cetera. So it's a, it's a great place to have those conversations. Next slide, please. The, um, that's all I have for you, Heidi. Oh, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? This is Stacy. <clears throat> My voice is out. I'm so sorry. But I want to just add that the other aspect um, in these projects is when a couple projects uh, get picked up by some of the different funders, you're able to leverage the due diligence. So reviewing performas, putting together promissory notes or grant agreements or however those projects get structured often requires a level of not only due diligence, but documentation, oversight. If there's a deed restriction from one of the jurisdictions that's integrated into the agreement, you really have to have a level of coordination um, at the local level. And when you're talking about tax credits, um, you are suddenly also interacting not only with the permanent financing institution, but also the state. And so, you know, I, I go back to a project that Martis Fund, Town of Truckee, and TTCF were engaged with. And we were able to utilize Town of Truckee's due diligence and their attorney's review. And then Martis Fund's attorney stepped in and then TTCF's did. And it just saves everybody a ton of time when we're all kind of coordinated and organized. And so um, the other point I wanted to just add is you're seeing a little snapshot of the projects that were reviewed by the group this week. But we don't want to get out in the community in a way that um, what, what should I say? It, 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 it gets ahead of the developers and the jurisdictions. And so we, we try and keep the information of the applications anonymous. So that's why it seems a little vague. We're telling you, we looked at one in the town. We looked at one in Placer. We're telling you that it, one was seasonal, one was true affordable, one was tax credit related, one was more, you know, not in the maybe affordable, but more in the achievable. So we're getting smarter as organizations, how to manage community capital. And that's the other piece is when you, when you look at that circle of community capital, we want to grow more of that because, 
you know, the more flexible, locally driven financial resources we can bring to bear, the more we can see projects that aren't just one type of project that fits state and federal funds. It gives us more flexibility to get creative with the type of diverse housing inventory that we're looking for. And so, you know, you'll see later in the in the um, meeting, you know, different ways in which new community capital has come to the table. Um, but with, you know, the resources that we have as a region, it's just so important to be aligned so we can be strategic and make sure that when public dollars or philanthropic dollars are going towards housing projects, that they're really lining up to the goals that this broader group is helping steward. Thank you for letting me jump in, Heidi. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I appreciate it. All right, thanks so much, guys. Um, with that, I'm going to let Kathy Foley with the North Tahoe Truckee Homeless Services provide us with an update on the Homelessness and Supportive Housing Working Group and what they've been working on. Kathy? Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you and um, see all the progress that's been made over the last um, quarter. And um, I'm grateful to be here to be able to share with you some of the amazing steps forward that have happened in the Supportive Housing Homelessness Work Group. Um, next slide, please. And here is a list of our um, partners that are attending all the meetings that are really working on this um, collaborative plan for um, Eastern County and Nevada Placer County. And um, as other groups have shared, if things come up today and you feel drawn to want to be part of this group or have further questions, please reach out to myself or to Christina and happy to provide specific information about terms that come up today or invite you to join us at our next meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a quick overview um, of the exciting fact that both Nevada and Placer County are prioritizing homeless, homelessness and homeless um, ending homelessness. And it's been going on for a long time with um, a lot of traction and energy being in the Western County area. And so over the last couple of years, especially when COVID started, um, it's been really rewarding to see our ability here in Eastern County to um, really step it up and start addressing these um, challenges in a really proactive way. And um, in 2018-19, both Nevada and Placer County developed a strategic plan. And um, the strategies that they had come up with was to get more opportunities for the house, use the housing first model, which basically states you give somebody who's homeless a, a house, a place to stay, that gives them the stability to um, move forward with their goals and their health and being an active part of a community. And it takes the burden off of the healthcare system and the legal system and our police forces. Um, goals have been to make it easier to access treatment, to um, grow outreach teams that can go meet people where they're at. And then a big piece of the puzzle is um, using the HMIS system, which is the computer system that allows us to each individually um, enter in people that are using our programs in this area, enter in people that are chronically homeless and have been here a long time. And then really on a regular basis, our group does it weekly, um, sit down and look at the folks that are on that list and get to know people in the community that um, are our neighbors and then work around solutions to house those people or to connect them to other services. And all of the amazing funding that's coming available in the next couple of years that can be used in our area um, needs to be things that are supported by these plans that the county um, has put together. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go into a little more detail on Nevada County's plan to end homelessness. Um, this is a plan they're working on that they hope to have complete in the, the, the plan complete in the spring of 2022. And this will kind of be a framework of um, them being able to um, increase the federal funding that's available through the continuum of cares, which will also be able to overflow into our area and the things that our communities decide are important. And these are the five priorities on that list. And um, on these items, I'm going to go ahead in the next few slides and give you the exciting examples of where our region really falls into um, these buckets, let's call them. 
Um, so I'll go into each each one on the next coming slides. Um, next slide, please. So um, the number one bucket was to prevent and diverse people from being homeless. And so we've seen a huge push for that through the rental assistance that's been available since COVID started. And both Sierra Community House and AMI Housing and um, I'm sure some other organizations have really been um, pushing and really helping our neighbors to engage in this rental assistance and keep them from becoming housed, unhoused. Um, the second bucket is um, expanding outreach and supportive services within the community. And both Continuum of Cares for Placer and Nevada County really stepped up and provided a large amount of funding to North Tahoe Truckee Homeless Services to um, fulfill these goals for the coming year. And so we have the Respite Day Center that's open Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 9 until 2 providing the listed services here. And this is really a place for our chronically homeless, our folks living in um, cars, our folks that um, need help with basic necessities. And sometimes that's just um, connection in a way to get themselves um, back out of town. The other piece with supportive services is we've really been able to increase our ability to do street outreach. Um, in the past, there's been one street outreach position that's been held by Sierra Community House. And it was really hard to get the traction to go out and meet people where there are um, and cover all those bases for both Placer and Nevada County. And so um, this additional funding has allowed us to um, have two more part-time people so that we actually have a team approach. Um, we're hoping to be able to expand it as they've done in Western County. So some of that includes having social workers potentially or a nurse or um, someone from the police force um, to go out in, in um, meet people where they're at also. Next slide, please. The third bucket on that plan is to expand shelter beds and non-congregate shelter options. And um, the way our region is able to fall into that is we have the emergency warming center, which will continue again this winter. Um, we have a temporary location through this season at Church of the Mountains in Truckee. And we have um, plans in place to be able to engage people in both Placer and Nevada County to access this service. Uh, it's seasonal. We're gearing up to be able to start opening in November and we'll make nights available through the end of April. And um, at this time, we're only able to open on the most severe weather triggered nights. Um, those weather triggers are 15 degrees or less, but are more a snow or other severe weather conditions, which often involve rain and high winds, which are actually the most difficult to be stuck living outside in or um, stranded here for some reason and having to um, deal with without support. And so on the nights that we are open, we open at 6 p.m. to provide dinner, a warm place to sleep, basic necessities. And um, in the morning, there's case management to help people either onto their next step or um, if they're one of our local neighbors, um, just continue the case management and support that we're providing. The second piece that falls into this bucket um, is there was a request for proposal that was put out by Nevada County um, to be turned in by January of this coming year. Um, they're really looking to find organizations that will step in and provide non-congregate shelter options. And so this would be an opportunity where um, they're looking to be able to have at least 10 rooms available, whether that comes in the form of hotel rooms or comes in a form of rental properties where they can house people and provide them on-site support being that goal. Um, so this funding is something that at this point, there isn't the capacity for any organization that stepped up to say, I'm in, I'm applying, but it's something our group will continue to discuss. And um, maybe there's a way for someone to take advantage of that program this coming year. Next slide, please. The fourth bucket is the real big goal to increase housing stock and both Placer and Nevada County um, are really supportive of this idea and Placer County was the leader where last year with 
um, Placer County and AMI Housing. They came together, went through the home key funding process, and were able to purchase the Seven Pines Motel over in Kings Beach. And it's currently in the rehab process. They're waiting for final plans and jumping through some hurdles that came up and working on the additional funding that's needed. But at the end of that process, there will be 12 units of supportive housing, which is permanent housing with um, low rents, with um, supportive services on site, um, available in the Placer County um, area, which is really exciting. And currently, um, Nevada County, along with AMI Housing and the town of Truckee, are actively discussing some properties that may be able to work for this current upcoming round of home key funding or a future one um, with the goal being, again, to find a place in Truckee that we can provide permanent supportive housing. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, each RFP is different, but we're hoping that there will be space available for a permanent location for the day center or the navigation center that's really been key to um, all the work that's being done. And we right now, again, we're in a temporary location over at Church of the Mountains um, through June. Next slide, please. Oh, back on the housing, I just have to throw in there that we're really grateful for the town of Truckee and Shauna Doherty and all the developers and people, um, Martis Fund, that have worked together um, for those 288 new units. Um, a big win was um, the developer over at Coldstream. Um, in our community, for the very first time, we have um, 12 units of what's called HUD H11 um, housing, which is housing for folks with disabilities. So um, again, it's a place for someone to have a roof over their head for them to engage in services and pay rent of no more than 30% of their income. Um, so we're really excited for that too. Um, the fifth bucket is, um, you know, just increasing collaboration and working through, working towards functional zero. And um Functional zero is a milestone. It's a dynamic milestone that's always changing. But through the work on the um, inputting people into HMIS and having groups pull what's called a by name list and getting to know our neighbors that are unhoused and getting to know their needs um, intimately, it allows us to be aware and work towards building the systems that will make it possible for homelessness or chronic homelessness and veterans homelessness to be to be rare and to be short because there's enough supportive housing or transitional housing um, or emergency services um, to help people move into permanent housing quickly. And so um, one piece of that is having rapid rehousing and housing support. So we have case managers that are focused on helping newly homeless neighbors back into housing quickly. And a lot of times that's just the funding for first month's rent security deposit Maybe it's a need for a small amount of um, rent support for the next three or four months as they get back into working more. Um, but it's a it's a support that allows people to get themselves back into housing and um, back on track as quickly as possible. Um, this fuzz funding can also be used to support our chronically homeless neighbors or anybody who's literally homeless, um, living in their car, living on the street. Um, into some of the lower income housing units that have been available. And once again, the same premises, you know, pr potentially providing that first and last month's rent, help with a utility deposit, and then providing them some support for the upcoming three, six, sometimes longer months while that person gets stabilized and is able to work um, in having these low income units that have um, income caps of 30% of your income, 40% of your income really makes that doable for some of our lower workforce that's making $15 or more an hour. Um, Another piece of the puzzle is improved data collection. And so we've made huge strides in this in the last year. At one point, there was um, you know, one HMIS license, which is one person who's licensed to actually access that system. And um, at this current point, we have four people that are licensed in this area um, between Sierra Community House and um, North Tahoe Truckee Homeless Services. And we're really trying to get everybody 
that possible into that system so that we can know who is in need in our community. Um, other agencies are participating also as um, people can always get onto that HMIS list through calling 211. So connecting point and 211 are connected to this also. And that's the basis for connections to shelters outside of the area, services in Placer and Nevada County, um, and the, the work up here we're doing to really um, get to know our neighbor and create those services. Um, part, the next part of that process is um, we've been able to, through that HMIS system, we pull what's called a by name list, which are our most vulnerable chronically homeless neighbors. And each week there's a call that North Tahoe Truckee Homeless Services program manager and case managers partner with Tammy Gregerson um, of 211 Connecting Point. And, um, you know, we've been trained on a system to evaluate these folks, help them take steps forward, talk about strategy. And um, Brendan Phillips in Nevada County, um, housing resource manager, was really helpful in getting us trained to do that to where now our team and Connecting Point are doing that on a weekly basis and really seeing the benefits and um, getting people into housing here before winter. Uh, another thing we're collaborating on is that we're getting prepared for the point in time count that'll happen um, at the end of January and um, more to come on that, but we will collaborate with Western County. We'll have a strategic plan um, that Jasmine Bro is helping put together. And we really hope that when we're able to go out and do that count, that we'll be able to have as many uh, housed homeless folks, as far as folks that might be living in transitional housing or at the warming center that night, have them counted, as well as our unhoused neighbors who could be living in their cars or who could be um, living outside during that time. And the importance of those counts would be that it lets Nevada and Placer County know um, the number of people we have up in this community that need the support. And then we get a percentage of the HUD, um, the larger state and federal funding that comes available based on the number of people that we're able to support. Um, and all of these steps and collaborating together will hopefully help us reach that space of functional zero. And Nevada County's current plan is targeting 2000, 20, 2025 is that time when we can all celebrate um, functional zero for our veterans and our chronic homeless neighbors. Um, we, I'm happy to answer any questions on this. And I also um, invite you to our next working group meeting, which is going to be next Wednesday, the 27th from 2.30 to 4. And at that meeting, one of our main topics will be um, Brendan Phillips with, as the housing resource manager will be there to share more about the plan, um, their plan and um, the process and potentially brainstorm on using those funds for non-congregate shelter. And um, I'd invite anybody who's interested to come and join us. And I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thanks, Kathy. It looks like Brittany has uh, posted a question about whether there are options for uh, homeless individuals in terms of their companion animals and being able to bring them with them, whether that's home key, um, any kind of hotel programs, maybe also domestic violence shelter programs might include as well. So what I can weigh in on is, you know, thankfully here in Truckee, we are a very pet friendly system. And so, for example, the emergency warming center and day center are pet friendly um, and they don't even need to per se be a companion animal. They need to be a well-behaved animal. If not, their owner needs to be willing to um have them in a kennel while, while they're there, which we have, but most of those pets and companion animals come in and are really just part, part of the program. Um, the supportive housing units that are available now, to my knowledge, they all would allow for a companion animal. Um, they're could be some restrictions, maybe on breeds or um, sizes, depending on the location that they're moving into. But I believe most of those are very pet friendly. And at this point, I can't weigh in on the domestic violence shelters and things through Sierra Community House. Although if that's important, I am definitely happy to get that answer for you. But our main goal is to really not exclude people because of their pets. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. And maybe Allison, who also has her hand up, can speak to some of that as well. Allison, did you have a question? Thanks, Tara. No, I just had a comment. I just, um, <clears throat> Kathy, really wanted to commend you and Church of the Mountains and the Emergency Warming Center 
crew and volunteers and staff. And I feel like, um, not for the first time, but I think the conversation that we've been having around homelessness for the last like six months or so is very different than the conversation we've been having for the last, you know, eight to 10 years. And I think, um, starting the emergency warming center and really church of the mountains and United for action, taking it on and staffing it volunteers and then working with the jurisdictions around funding has really helped develop our capacity around supporting our individuals experiencing homelessness. And we often talk about like community readiness and how do we help like support readiness of our, not only our community-based partners, but our jurisdictions and our residents really help like understand and support an idea and be ready to, you know, ultimately support our individuals experiencing homelessness. And I feel like your work has really done that in, in you in particular. And I also think Tara, the um, homeless working group coming under the umbrella of the Mountain Housing Council has been very helpful <clears throat> and has again, expanded the conversation be beyond just like a handful of us to an entire um, council. So thank you so much, Kathy, for all your work. And thanks to the Mountain Housing Council. It's really exciting to hear and step back and see like, oh my gosh, like we now have a by name list. And we have like four people who can use HMIS instead of like one license. Like this, we were stuck for so long. So it, it feels good to like see everything become slowly unstuck. I know there's still a lot of work to do, but I think it's really, really impressive. So thank thank you. you, Allison. I know coming from where we started in 2015, it's really exciting to see um, what all those things you mentioned and people working together can do. So thank you all for the support. And um, I look forward to having that functional zero in our region also. Great, thanks Kathy and Allison. All right, Shana, oh. do you have your name? I think I see Shauna's hand up. Shana. Yeah, <clears throat> morning everyone. I just wanted a quick comment before we move past this comment, uh, I mean this topic. Um, so uh, there's been um, a few conversations that I've been having in the community about um, homeless, individuals moving into our existing affordable housing and what that means for our community. Um, and it's a bigger topic, but I think as we um, move forward with providing more housing and more services for our community, um, I think there's a perception out there that we're housing people from outside of the area. And um, Kathy, I just, for the group to talk about, you know, um, people that are experiencing homelessness and mental health issues are, are very, it's a transient community. And so people from our community are also leaving and going to other communities and getting services. And therefore there's people coming in here um, to get services. And um, I think the perception is that we should only be serving people that are from our community. And that is just not the case with how the world works and how our country and our state works. And so I just think in the future, it would be a good um, topic to share sort of, you know, um, a little bit more of how we serve, who those people are, where they're coming from, and also that it really is a national and a state issue and that regionally we need to participate and does it really matter whether the person is born and raised and grew up here and works, has been here for 10 years, or is it all of our responsibility to serve uh, the needs of people who are here and that is our community? So I just, I've just been hearing um, some conversations and I just wanted to start that conversation in the future. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Shauna. That is a discussion and um, I'll bring it up at our work group meeting coming forward, but definitely uh, maybe at our next meeting, I can report back because um, yeah, it's it's a topic that'll take quite, you know, 10 minutes or so to go, even go into, but I appreciate you bringing that back up and the importance of having that larger discussion at a community level. Great, thanks everyone. I, see. I think that's a super good point, Shauna. And, you know, I like I see the homeless crisis in California as kind of like the climate crisis, right? Like we have a social kind of issue that creates this, this um, you know, this need. And it's going to take collective action of all of us to address that need across every community. But I think there's an underlying premise here, too, that I find difficult to believe. And in the housing 
needs assessment. I don't think that we adequately captured, nor do I think the homeless count adequately captures the actual number of local residents who are living in vehicles and in transition and, you know, in the forests surrounding the region. We, you know, it's hard for us to really believe that there are that many people who are working in the service industry, primarily in our region, who are living in vehicles, but they are, and they're out there all the time. And I see them and talk to them all the time. And it is impossible for me to believe that we only have 26 homeless people in the North Lake Tahoe Truckee region, because I see a lot more than that in my everyday interactions, you know? So one way we might really think about addressing this in the long run is, is a, I know everyone's been doing the best that they can to do the homeless count, but how do we do a better homeless count? You know, because I just don't think we're getting to everybody and we don't really understand the depth of the issue in our community. You know, I think that's a really good point, Steve, and just starting to talk about what we can do differently with future housing needs assessments and boots on the ground and actually counting people who may not have a computer and have access to kind of yeah. surveys that way, as well as looking at other impacts as well. You know, we've talked about environmental impacts of homelessness and a lack of housing as well, and kind of starting to measure those as well. Um, so I think that's a really good point and something to think about for future housing needs assessments. Yeah. And Steve, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think there are one of the pieces as we're starting to plan this with Jasmine is just the fact that we do want to reach out and this group will be one of those groups because the folks that are living in cars and working um, are not being counted because they're not coming into access services and some of that's right. pride. They don't want to admit I'm homeless. It's like, nope, just live this. Is, I'm living in my car. I'm working at Palisades Tahoe. And um, so I think this year and over the last couple of years, we've tried to count those people's because we've watched those numbers come up. But when you have two days to go out and catch them in their van in a parking lot, it doesn't work. So um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to put something out ahead of time, which even allows, for example, you, Steve, to be able to say, you know what, there's going to be an opportunity. It's important to be counted that information. And, and hey, if you call this number at this point in time, um, you know, you're going to get a $25 gift card, gift card for helping fill out the survey plus us, it really helps our region and accessing and building the housing. So thank you for saying that and um, rest assured that there will be information that comes out um, probably early December that really engages anybody um, who's willing to help with that because the count is way higher than what we have in HMIS. Um, those are really our chronically homeless, potentially very visible folks that are struggling the most on the street, but it doesn't address the truth of homelessness. Well, your work is absolutely inspiring, Kathy. Well, thank you. We are fortunate to have you in our community. You're here. Great. Thanks, everyone. With thank that, I'm going to go much, ahead and everybody. open things up to partner updates. Um, this can include any of the updates you all submitted on our website in August and September because folks were quite active in submitting those. Thank you again for that. It's really important. Uh, Chris has his hand up. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, if you haven't met me yet, uh, Chris Vakash, I'm on the uh, board of directors of the Truckee Chamber of Commerce. So just a couple more timely updates from the chamber. Uh, we're coming off our 68th annual Chamber Awards, which was a resounding success uh, back on September 24th. So if you were there, I hope you had a great time honoring uh, local businesses uh, most popular comment we got was uh, people really like the open air format versus the more buttoned up suit and tie Ritz Carlton format. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, the chamber is currently exploring, you know, how we can evolve in this new community environment where we still continue to provide the, you know, utmost value to our, uh, our business community. So essentially we're looking to revamp the chamber for modern times and this kind of complicated 
um, environment with housing and everything. So uh, really kind of boiled down to two points uh, that have come up in our, these preliminary discussions ultimately, which will lead up to our January uh, board retreat. And one is our, you know, reviewing our advocacy policy, just seeing if there's anything there that we can sharpen so that we are a better, stronger, um, uh, more effective voice for our uh, business community. And then lastly is, you know, is there some sort of housing element, you know, that the chamber could uh, take on? Um, you know, we look at these sur- the surveys from the business community and the, obviously the number one response is, you know, we need housing for employees. So it's, you know, we have this at the chamber. I think we all kind of have this general feeling of obligation that, you know, we need to do something more. Um, and if, if, you know, we're not quite sure what that is just yet, but we're starting to have those conversations. So moving forward, um, you know, we can work with Mount Housing Council, SBC, and maybe kind of get your recommendations on how you can maybe see the chamber, you know, stepping up and maybe playing a larger part in that. So that's all from the chamber for now. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris. Cindy. Thanks, Stacy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to report. Um, I'll try to make this pretty quick on all the activities of Placer County because I know we've submitted those into the report. Um, but it's great to see everybody this morning, this nice rainy morning. Um, we joined the Truckee Tahoe Workforce Housing Agency, and we were sworn in as new partners on October 20th. And of course, we're joining uh, all of the members, current members, as well as uh, joining with the town of Truckee and Nevada County and that JPA. We're excited to be part of it and to start moving uh, more collaboratively, not that we weren't collaborative before, but more officially collaboratively uh, moving forward. Um, also wanted to report that this Tuesday, um, our Board of Supervisors will hear an update on the Dollar Creek Crossing project on Dollar Hill. Um, that's the 11 acre site we've been working on for a couple of years now uh, on developing a project um, of with a mix of housing types, including uh, rental and for sale product. So that update will be given this Tuesday. Unfortunately, uh, late yesterday, we moved our Board of Supervisors meeting out of Tahoe and back down to Auburn so that only one supervisor is out on the highway uh, on uh, Monday and Tuesday when we're uh, in the midst of this storm. So, um, But we do plan to be back up in Tahoe maybe in November for updates. Um, we also had our housing code amendments were approved by the Planning Commission October 7th. We'll be coming to the full board as uh, we talked about earlier on November 16th that will include tiny homes, small lot cluster developments and mixed use. Um, and so those uh, will be coming to the board for approval. Um, on Friday, October 1st, we were pleased to participate with Nevada County and Town of Truckee and great job to everybody who organized an incredible event with our state officials to celebrate uh, the new housing units um, in the region. That was really great to be part of, and I think was um, thanks to so many who organized that. I was pleased to be part of it, um, but you all did the hard work, so thank you for that. And then um, also working with the TRPA, the Tahoe Living Working Group, and my role on the governing board there, we're working with those accessory dwelling units and making those easier to build in the Tahoe Basin. Not easy to do when you have two states and you have to come up with rules and um, regulations that address both states' issues. So um, working on those and really appreciate the hard work of TRPA staff on that. And then on Monday, September 13th, we launched an online zoning platform uh, to allow property owners and developers to really look at the zoning throughout the county uh, on any property in unincorporated Placer County. So that spans quite a large region, but certainly supports efforts for uh, developers and others to look at opportunities within our region specifically. Um, 
many other things, but I think probably most of interest that we're hearing a lot of from the policy level is what will we do with short-term rentals? Uh, working on a final ordinance now that will come back to an update at the Board of Supervisors in December uh, with hopeful adoption in time for the March 31st, 2022 deadline. Uh, we are conducting an economic study with BAE, Bay Area Economics, on the inflationary pressures of short-term rentals on uh, housing prices in our region, uh, because that was one of the con key concerns of many of our property management firms and understanding, will it immediately free up housing? Will it free up housing over a period of time? And what are the inflationary pressures uh, there? And in conjunction with that, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that our workforce housing preservation program that started has now 10 uh, applicants in, um, in the queue waiting for uh, trying to find homes that they can actually purchase where they can afford um, the payment after we invest uh, in our deed restriction program. So that is really our challenge right now with the huge inflation in property values that 15% uh, or up to $100,000 that we would invest in a deed restriction for local workers buying a home um, isn't, isn't um, helping enough to get anybody into escrow yet, but we're hopeful that we'll see some movement in that regard. And then um, looking across our county uh, related to the, um, the discussion we were just having on homelessness, I just wanted the group to know that Placer County is working, set up a homeless task force throughout our county that is really focused with our city governments uh, on looking at what we're calling a campus of hope location somewhere in the county uh, to provide um, a, a real um, incorporated campus of um, full services uh, to our homeless population, obviously. Um, we know the situations are different here than in Western County, but it's a crisis throughout our county. And so we're working with our cities and a consultant team to bring that forward. We're also um, in communication. I've been working with Supervisor Bullock in Nevada County on discussing further about uh, for next summer, safe camping locations uh, for some of those that are living and sleeping in vehicles. What can, how can we provide um, locations and opportunities for that to occur. There's so much more going on and Shauna and Emily are on the call if I've missed anything, um, but they're doing all the hard lifting and I just so appreciate everybody's working. Uh, the staffs at the town of Trucking, Nevada County and Placer County are working so well together to um, address these issues. So thank you. Great, thanks, Cindy. I think we had Allison, Emily, and then Jen. Thank you, Tara. Um, so I appreciate the time. I just wanted to give a very quick update that the collaborative under the umbrella of the Community Foundation recently completed the North Tahoe Truckee Behavioral Health Landscape and Roadmap. Um, so it's an assessment of um, really kind of our gaps and opportunities around substance use disorder services and mental health services. And so we had a number of um, key findings and we are again working on the rollout. So um, we're kind of pulling together all the data and compiling it in a way that will be e easily digestible um, to our partners and community. And so I'll be sharing that with you at some future point, but I just wanted to kind of share a couple of things that have been very compelling to us. So we know, and again, this is not gonna be super surprising for um, most of us on the call, but our key issues that adult and youth substance use is a significant issue. We know that adult and youth anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation are significant issues, and economic stress and strain are significant issues. And so when we start looking at what the contributing factors are for all of our key issues, we find that lower wages, housing security, high cost of living are consistent toxic stressors for our community. So again, I think when we talk about housing for the people and the impact on mental health and substance use disorder, there's a pretty significant connection. So I look forward to unpacking that all with you in the future. And um, the report is now on the Community Foundation website if anyone wants to early peek at it. But again, I'd love to share more in the future, Tara. Great, thanks, Allison. Thanks. Emily, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, before I put on my housing agency hat, just a quick follow-up on what Chris shared with us. 
And I also sit on the chamber board and we are working to understand how the chamber can step up to support the housing issues in the region. So as we move forward to our strategic planning process, I'm hopeful that many of the, the agencies represented here can help us think through um, the best fit for the chamber as it relates to housing support. So Chris, thank you very much for sharing that. On the workforce housing agency front, um, Cindy shared a bit, some exciting news that we welcome to the um, town of Truckee, Placer County, and Nevada County as new member agencies to the Truckee Town Workforce Housing Agency on Wednesday. So moving forward, we will be representing about 2,500 employees uh, across seven of our public agencies here in the Truckee Tahoe region. Uh, very exciting. On the work front, um, we are still working towards our first potential housing development project, hopeful to announce more details to the group in the next few months. At the same time, exploring other parcels of land that are owned by our member agencies and other potential regional partners for workforce housing development as well. Uh, we are working on a uh, down payment assistance program and um, working on our first potential master leasing agreement as well. So some good uh, progress moving forward with our work. And then finally, um, our member agencies, as you all know, represent the constituents of the Truckee Tahoe region, and each of them are concerned about the region as a whole and how they can help the general public in addition to helping their, their employees to secure housing and access housing opportunities. So the conversations around the public-private component and how we can continue to help more than just the employees of our member agencies of our mission states is something that's very important to our member agencies and that we're talking about um, much more frequently than we were uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and we understand that we need to um, step up for our general public in addition to uh, the employees that we represent. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Jen, do you want to go ahead? Um, sure. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. We're going to um, tag team our effort here in, in providing the updates. We have a, a lot of people working on a lot of different things. And I would just echo how um, excited we are to be new members of the JPA. We had our first meeting this week, and that was great. Um, so thank you to Emily and the entire team um, for that. We look forward to that partnership. And then um, also to acknowledge the work of um, the Placer County team and, and Shauna and the uh, town team for the uh, October ribbon cutting for the housing celebration for um, the regional units. It was um, really great to see all those units coming online. We had a great presence um, from the state and state officials here acknowledging that and it was an opportunity to um, chat with them about housing and other topics and Thank you to Placer County and Supervisor Augustuson for hosting lunch in advance um, with us. Um, that was a pleasure. So with that, I'm going to ask Hillary if she can give an update on our STR um, ordinance process. Sure. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, on September 28th, town, our town council adopted a temporary moratorium on the issuance of new short-term rental um, permits or registration certificates, and that was um, in response to our housing crisis um, to give us the time to complete a study on our short-term rental program, which we'll bring back to town council for consideration in January. Um, as part of that study, we've stood up a advisory committee, which has 11 members um, of stake stakeholders from a broad range, including um, representatives involved in short-term rental market, as well as housing advocates, a local employer, two council members. Um, and we had our first meeting this week, which was a robust start of a discussion. And we'll be um, digging into uh, models used in other, uh, other communities, as well as other ideas on how the town might approach sort of a um, more of a managed approach to short-term rentals moving forward. Um, so that has been an exciting process. We have two more meetings coming up in November and December. Also as part of that process, uh, we'll be bringing back to town council next week an update um, report on, on that study, as well as an extension of that moratorium and staff is proposing an extension through June of 2022 to give us time to complete that study process. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Yumi for planning updates and our town general plan. Thanks, Hillary. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of planning efforts happening in October. It's been a flurry of activity here with planning commission and soon to be town council. Uh, 
in October, we had a um, planning commission looked at our innovate gateway strategy, which is looking at the downtown uh, the Donner Pass Road corridor and whether or not mixed use or higher density should be um, looked at in that corridor, along with improvements to the streetscape beyond what has already occurred through the Envision DPR process. Uh, Town Council will be looking at that with planning commission's recommendations um, identified uh, on our October 26th meeting, so on Tuesday. And then on October 19th, the Planning Commission also looked at our land use alternatives, which is part of our general plan process, uh, which is looking at key locations within our town and potential changes to our zoning and our land use designations within the town. Um, they continued that meeting on October 19th, and we'll have a special meeting on Monday, October 25th, for them to provide further recommendations on all of the focus areas in the, as identified in the general plan process. Um, and then on just the development review standpoint, we did, the Planning Commission did look at the Estates Meadows project, which is a 30 unit affordable housing project over by the rodeo grounds in Truckee. And that got, got continued to November. Um, there are some potential concerns with wetlands uh, in the area and some concessions made to the design, but they'll be looking at that on November 16th. So there are some Activity, there is some activity going on in Truckee and on the planning front, so I hope you tune in. And then I'll turn it over to Council Member Romack to give an update on uh, workforce housing grants in Truckee. Thanks, Yumi, and yeah, thanks to Yumi and your team for all the hard work. You guys have been busy with lots of community meetings. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Uh, but yeah, just a brief update. Tara mentioned it in the, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the Town of Truckee's Workforce Housing Rental Grant. This provides incentives to homeowners to rent uh, to local residents. This summer, our council voted to expand the program. So there are different grants available based on the length of time you rent your house as well as how many uh, folks that live in your house and you can do rooms as well as full house. And so far this has helped uh, bring 40 homes into the program, which is incredible and house uh, 63 locals. So we're really excited about the success of this program and look forward to continue to see the growth and do also want to thank uh, Kai from Landing Locals. I saw she was on this and, and you know, they're a great partner in this program. And with that, I'll pass it over to Shauna Doherty, who's hard at work on lots of things uh, that she'll share more on now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks to everyone else. A um, <clears throat> couple updates on the three um, projects that are um, close, that equal our sort of 188 units that are opening this year. So Coldstream, Trekkie Artist Law and Frischman, too. Just wanted to give a Quick update on those. So Coldstream is the 48 units over by the state park, which is 60% um, AMI. Um, we have a great new property manager over there that lives on site and <clears throat> is wonderful to work with. Um, she is, they're really struggling with filling those units. So I think they're at um, maybe at around 10 of the 48 filled because um, our population um, is making more than the 60%, which is um, in the case of this project, about $35,000 for one person. Um, so we're continuing to have discussions um, on ways to help them with marketing um, and, and how to figure out how to work with that, that unique issue that we didn't think we were going to have. Um, Truckee Artist Lofts, um, the East Wing is full, um, a fabulous um, new property manager there named Pia also lives on site um, with her little four-year-old. Um, she's wonderful to work with, longtime Truckee local, moved to Reno and then is back. Um, so just having those uh, great property managers is just um, really great for our community and working with them and working through sort of um, the bumps along the way. Um, talk to the project manager who is working on getting the certificate of occupancy and final um, finaling the West building in the next couple of weeks. So I know there's people that are waiting to get in there and that's, um, I think they have a few slots open, but, um, as soon as they get the um, building open, the people will move in there and that will be a full place. Um, Frischman too, is just, um, taking names for the wait list and they're a little further behind, but hope to open this year as well. 
Um, we have two more projects that are in line uh, going through the entitlement process and the financing. Um, so we, we talked about those, but that's another 77 units that are going to come online. And um, depending on the financing they get, they'll either be at the 80% or the 60%. Um, but one of them is entitled and one is going through the entitlement process that Yumi mentioned. So again, more ribbon cuttings. Um, if they are successful with getting their money and getting um, their everything um, in place. Um, the great news about, I just want to remind you that of one of those, the um, Pacific Crest Commons, um, we're working with Nevada County and the Regional Housing Authority and Kathy's group to make sure that eight of those would be um, our first ever in the town of Truckee supportive housing units. Um, and again, that is not just housing, but the ability to, pro to provide services on site. So um, we've been talking about this model and bringing this to our region and we have it in Kings Beach and now um, expanding to Truckee with this um, new project. So just good to remember that. Um, below market rate housing. So our, our version of the housing preservation, super exciting, Cindy, to hear that 10 people um, are on that list. Um, and we are uh, working with um, Aaron from BAE and um, Matt from Rise Housing to get our program off the ground and bring it to town council in December to just give um, give them an update and a and a uh, you know get, see the get their temperature on the direction that we're going and then um, hope, hoping to bring it to council for approval in January. So pretty quick. Um, we really see the two goals of our below market rate housing program is both to expand the inventory of deed restricted units, but also to um, really pro more proactively and better manage our existing deed restriction. So we, it's really sort of a twofold and we'll be working in lockstep with Placer County to make sure that we're um, really creating one regional program with maybe variations in Placer and Truckee, but that ultimately for our customers and for our realtors who are gonna be the ambassadors of these programs, um, that we really work together. Um, our committee, we have a committee um, with uh, comprised, I think a third of it is realtors. We have a, a mortgage broker and um, our regular partners, but um, it's great to have their perspective to make sure that whatever we roll out actually would work in this market. And um, the crazy thing is before we even get these programs out the door, I'm getting phone calls from people who hear that we're going to have something like this and want us to want the program now. So that's always a good place to be in. Um, I wanted to just um, end with this um, fun story, which is um, early, on Tuesday, I went down and was invited by Jeff Lux, who is um, uh, a professor down at UC Davis in the Graduate School of urban planning and sustainability. And um, he asked me to come down and speak to his graduate class of about 30 who are our next, they are the next leaders and staff, right? Who are gonna be working on housing and transportation and community development. And, um, and I talked to them about how, um, Town of Truckee, I talked to them about Mountain Housing Council and then a couple other models. And what's so amazing when I was driving out, I was thinking that these students, don't even know what it's like to operate without the Mountain Housing Council model. So they're going into the workforce. Um, you know, we, we've all worked for years to build this model and build these innovative programs at the jurisdictions. And they're going into the workforce thinking this is the normal way to do um, housing and transportation. And I just, they were really engaged. And I'm just excited that as they go on after their graduate program into the workforce, that they're carrying these ideas and these models and different ways of doing things as just the normal way to do business. And I think that that's sort of an attestment to our legacy. And it was pretty fun to think about that. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. That's great. Thanks, Shauna. Okay. I think before we break, I also just want to welcome Kai with Landing Locals, who's a new partner, although they've been around for a long time. Hi, Kai. Welcome. Thank Did you. you want to just give a little spiel or say hello? Um, yeah, I think I know most of you. Um, we've been kind of attending meetings as, as non-partners or unofficial partners for 
a while now um, and were really brought into the fold of the Mountain Housing Council when we started with the support of um, TTCF. Um, so yeah, you guys have been kind of a big part of our, our founding story. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited to be official partners and, um, we've been really busy as Lindsay discussed, we, um, have been rocking and rolling with this, uh, these expanded program guidelines for the workforce rental grant program. Um, and we just expanded, um, our program also out to Breckenridge and Summit County, and then also just got approved earlier this week to launch a, an incentive program in South Lake Tahoe, which we'll be doing um, first thing in the new year. So yeah, really excited. Um, and I think that I'll, I'll share some more updates later in this meeting. Great. Thanks, Kai. That's wonderful to hear. Thanks. Great. Did anyone else have any other updates that they wanted to share? All right, well, I pasted it into the chat, but I just want to encourage everyone to go to the webpage um, where you can not only post your updates, but you can take a look at what everyone else has posted. Um, there are some exciting um, updates that have been posted by folks who are not on our call right now, including Sierra Community House, um, Tahoe Prosperity Center, probably on the call but hasn't shared. Um, a lot of really exciting things happening um, with those groups, um, just to name a few uh, that I've gotten through. Um, so just, you know, be sure to, to always um, post there and to thank you and a thank you for everyone who has been. It's really, really helpful to us so that everyone stays connected and in the loop and updated on each other and coordinated. Um, so with that, I'm going to let everybody take a break um, and just suggest that we uh, come back at about 935. Thanks so much.
All right, welcome back everyone. So we thought with this being the last meeting of the year and given the rollout of the of the draft regional housing implementation plan, we would make them what would make the most sense in terms of community impact storytelling would be to hear from a few different folks about the timeline of the regional capacity building that Mountain Housing Council has seen and experienced, uh, specifically to share the capacity that each of their organizations has built for housing solutions in the last five years alone. Um, so to start us out, I'm gonna turn things over to Stacy to discuss uh, 2016 and kind of Mountain Housing Council's launch. Stacy, are you there? I am here. Good morning, everybody. Um, forgive the head cold sound um, today. I can sing you a Stevie Nicks song if you prefer. Um, but I just, uh, in reflecting on the five years of capacity building, so in 2016, the town of Truckee, Placer, and Nevada County came together for an unprecedented um, a collaborative look at the regional housing needs. Prior to that time, uh, there had not been a collective look at the housing ecosystem. Um, and we know that we share the same school district, hospital district, airport district. We, we share many of the same um, employees in this region, but we never had really looked collectively at the data, which as you'll learn later, is not as easy as you think to just pull. Um, and part of what started that conversation began in a resource sharing meeting of the community collaborative in which many of our nonprofits were saying, we can't get to our own mission work, whether it's food security, family strengthening, um, housing stability without addressing the housing issue. Too many of our clients are dealing with housing instability and without that stability, we can't really begin to address the other needs that our clients have. And so after that resource sharing meeting in which we hosted the different jurisdictions to really understand what was going on with housing, a group decided to take it to the next level. And that collaborative housing study in 2016 was the first time the region came together to look at it collectively. TTCF facilitated that um, RFP and managed the contract with BAE um, to do it. And on the heels of that um, study, TTCF launched the Housing Solutions Fund, a philanthropic fund to help um, start to address housing issues in the community and also started talking to our partners that are at the table today um, about joining a collaborative conversation to advance and accelerate the solutions. Since that time, the Housing Solutions Fund has partnered with private philanthropy and primarily the Mardis Fund um, and, um, a, and another foundation that's been involved. And we've focused on three projects in the Housing Solutions Fund. We helped provide a seed grant to Landing Local to get off the ground to address the second homeowners that might be willing to provide housing for long-term rentals. We were able to bring money to bear both from Martis Fund, Private Philanthropy, and TTCF for the Truckee Artist Lofts in a, rec a recoverable loan that would allow them to be competitive for tax credits. And currently, we're working on a project at Donner Lake which is um, in the upper end of the area median income of achievable housing, which is the first project that we've worked on locally that isn't just the subsidized affordable tax credit dollars. It also represents infill, not a big project. Um, so it really speaks to the diversity. So that's a housing fund. And then you all kind of know the work that Mountain Housing Council has been focused on in convening working on um, policy improvements, myth-busting, community engagement, tiger teams, working groups, all the things that you guys have been involved in. And so that is the capacity that TTCF has been focused on over the last five years. So I will hand it off back to you, Tara, for our next capacity building story. Great, thanks. Heidi, did you wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about Martyrs Fund? 
Yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh, in 2016, the Martis Fund launched our down payment assistance program. And to date, we've supported over 50 families and provided over $2 million in down payment funds, which is pretty exciting and, and have continued to, to fund that program. Uh, we've also provided nearly a million dollars to local nonprofit organizations serving, serving homeless community members, as well as provided emergency support and rental assistance to those organizations. Uh, we've supported a uh, few development projects, $1.4 million to the Artist Lofts, $800,000 to the Frischman Hollow 2, uh, $100,000 to Meadowview Place, and we've recently just committed $800,000 up to a million to the Pacific Crest Commons project, which we're pretty excited about. And then the board is also committed to a million dollars for a deed restriction purchase program. Uh, we're working out the details now with uh, Placer County to administer that program. So it's pretty exciting. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah. Um, Placer, Shauna P. and Emily S., do you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, the cap and trade grant and everything else you guys have been doing? Meadowview, TBID, STRs, <laughs> Hopkins. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do want to share a little bit uh, just on the capacity building and, you know, kind of looking back to that 2016 period as well, be it, I think Supervisor Gustafson, you know, can attest that, you know, we saw this housing crisis kind of coming for a very long time. Um, but it was the leadership of the Placer County Board, you know, that uh, and the executive team of, of the county that in 2016 started to make some changes and, and bring in. Um, additional staff and resources focused in around housing. And um, for me, and, and what I want to share, you know, today, um, for sure, is um, just the culture shift that we have seen in Placer County. And um, kind of what I, I kind of talk about is housing first, which um, goes across all the different departments. I work directly with six different um, departments and agencies that that go from, you know, Department of Public Works to real estate services to facilities, economic development, PIO, um, community development agency. Um, and we all, you know, think housing first when something comes in. And I think that was probably the biggest culture shift that we've really seen and grown over the last, um, you know, four, three to four years or five years. And so with that, you know, a lot of, of foundational building um, has been um, done over the last few years. We call it building our tool chest. Um, and uh, many of it was designing and looking at those programs. And again, I can't thank the leadership of Placer County enough for letting us be creative um, and try to figure out, you know, what, what will work and, and testing different things and um, being able to be nimble in, in um, what we want to approach um, so, you know, after we mentioned earlier, the kind of the last piece of that, that foundation building, that tool chest filling is that code amendment um, that'll be coming to the board. It incorporates so much of what we've talked about um, that requires under, under jurisdiction code amendments to be modified, which always is a bigger lift. You generally have CEQA requirements and everything as part of that. Um, and with that, I think we're looking forward to turning that page. And um, now really diving into what we see as a priority next, which is construction, construction of housing, um, a mix of housing for um, for uh, a mix of housing types for a mix of household incomes, meeting everybody's need along the way. So, um, you know, that's I, I, I'm looking forward to to what's to come next. Thanks, Sean. Um, Jen and Shauna D on behalf of Truckee and general plan and <coughs> manager position and everything else. Jen, do you want me to go? Or is it, go ahead, you? Shauna, you can start out. I think yeah, I was just trying to lay out a, um, a timeline. Um, I, I, I haven't been, Jen and I are fairly new. I'm Jen's even newer than me. So I'll just uh, go off of, and you, me, hopefully you can chime in. I'm not going to do a comprehensive, but um, the town's been working on housing for years, um, um, more of a react uh, in the sense of um, from the planning side and then from the um, working with developers and the funding side. So, you know, this year is the celebration of close to 200 units, but it's as a result of years of work. Um, if you go back to 2016, I probably don't have these exactly right, but the town put $1.65 million into Truckee artist lofts for both soft financing and infrastructure needs. Um, somewhere in there, we 
joined Mountain Housing Council um, and uh, significant was um, being part of a tour where we went and looked at housing in Colorado and it kind of filled our heads. A lot of us on this call were there and it was significant because I think it is pretty amazing that we looked at Colorado and we're sort of envious of all that they have. And a few years later, we have so much of what they had um, and probably I'll say it probably like a little bit. I think ours is more interesting um, and, and uh, a little bit more diverse so uh, we went on that tour. I think there were about 10 of us from South Lake all the way up to Truckee who went on that tour. Um, as a result of that, or somewhere in there, council started to prioritize um, really significantly housing with the allocation of $2 million from the general fund earmarked to launch innovative new housing programs. Um, and that's really when we started to um, internally build some capacity at the town to shift from sort of reacting to projects that come in to think to be more proactive. Um, so the council decided to set up a housing division. I think it was in 2018. Um, two things, set up uh, internal housing division and then also um, get some local fu funding. And so it took till 2019 um, where we uh, floated this uh, bond measure and also this staffing role and in 2020 um, opened up the housing kind of division and then had uh, secured Measure K funding. And so we had that sort of internal capacity and then um, the funding, um, which allowed us to really roll out uh, the programs that we've talked about and, and start to um, work a little bit more proactively um, on housing. So. Anything else to add, Yumi or Jen? Um, thank you. Yumi, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think, Shana, you covered it really well. Um, it's a lot of work and many years, and it's all coming together, which is great. And Yumi, I see there if you have anything you want to add. <laughs> no, I don't have anything more to add. I think those hit the main points of what we've done in the past few years. Thanks, guys. Kai, do you want to get back to landing locals and talk a little bit more? Sure, yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier in in um, the intro, um, we really, landing locals was really started um, because of meeting members in this community, uh, namely Emily Vitus, who, who brought landing to the attention of TTCF and um, Stacy was really excited about what we had thought up. Um, we didn't, you know, we really thought that this was a problem, um, that there were just so many empty homes. Um, we had always been coming up to Tahoe and Truckee and, and seeing so many houses that were empty. And then when we moved up here, we were shocked that there was a, a, such a huge housing crisis, knowing that there was so much inventory that just wasn't being used. Um, and so that was really the the genesis of of the landing local story. Um, and Stacy really had a lot of confidence in in Jim Collins, despite us never having worked in housing before. Um, and and um, we got some initial funding um, from TTCF, uh, which really is what allowed us to start this this whole business. Um, and we really had it more as a consumer product um, at the beginning, really working directly with renters and with homeowners um, to match them up. And we still do that. That's still probably at this point, like about 40% of our business. Um, but because of the craziness in this market that exploded um, through COVID, we, um, really started to iterate and and were able to build capacity for find, for matching more people into housing or into houses um, when we partnered with Shauna and with the town of Truckee. Um, and now because of the grant program, um, it's it's really exploded in in matching locals to homeowners, matching local employees to homeowners. Um, and I think that that is a huge part of of our capacity growth. Um, and I really, I've loved this, this private public partnership. Um, and that's really what we're starting to replicate in other markets. And so, um, yeah, that's, uh, 
that's that's where we are now and and um, we're just hoping to build on that going forward. Great. Thank you, Kai. Exciting stuff. Um, Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about TRPA and the Housing Action Plan and code amendments and all that? Sure. Um, yeah, so this was a fun exercise, actually, Tara, and I just thought a little bit about some of the major milestones that I think help build capacity at TRPA and just other capacity that we've been seeing, and definitely the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation Workforce Housing Needs Assessment that came out in 2016 was like an exciting document, and Heidi Hildrum from Tahoe Prosperity Center gave it to me, and we were all passing it around, and I think that kind of started to get the wheels turning. Um, and then next was the South Tahoe Chamber Trek that Shauna just mentioned. I think that was a really key um, opportunity, getting kind of a lot of people from North Shore and South Shore together in a bus for four days, um, looking at different programs in Colorado and then getting to talk about it. Um, and I just remember at the end of that um, event, we were all at a restaurant. And I think that's where some um, people started talking about doing a needs assessment for the South Shore, which hadn't happened yet. So I think that was a direct, out of that directly came the South Shore Housing Needs Assessment that Tahoe Prosperity Center led, and then the South Shore Housing Action Plan. Um, by the end of that year, TRPA had the housing ombudsperson role. And then um, over 2019, um, at least in the South Shore, uh, a lot of partners were working on the housing action, the housing needs assessment and action plan. And then out of that, TRPA then um, identified our own housing priority um, set of pre housing priority actions that we started working on with the Tahoe Living Working Group that I know many, many people on this group are a part of, and it's a, a very dedicated group. Um, and so then finally from that, we uh, in July approved our first set of housing amendments by the TRPA governing board. And that included allowing accessory dwelling units on all residential parcels um, in the California side. We also um, allowed increased residential densities um, during when um, tourist units are redeveloping to residential. And we increased some opportunities for people to take advantage of our um, deed restriction program. So um, that was all completed in July. And we're starting to you know, implement that and roll that out. And we've had six ADU applications from Placer County. Um, I think I mentioned that last time. And then um, next week, we're going to get started on the next phase of um, the Tahoe Living Working Group, where we're going to be looking at the building envelope and how we can see if there's changes that can help support um, more multifamily housing through those co that code. And I think that's pretty much it. That's great, Karen. Thanks so much. Uh, Emily, Tahoe Truck, Tahoe Truckee Workforce Housing Agency. Yes, thank you. So in 2020, um, as a result of a conversation that happened at Mountain Housing Council in 2018, the Truckee Tahoe Workforce Housing Agency was born. Um, in the last about 16 months of our actual housing operations, we have helped over 100 employees access housing opportunities, look for housing, understand housing programs in the region. We have matched 20 employees with uh, homes directly through long-term lease uh, as part of our Landing Locals program and just direct connection through the Workforce Housing Agency. Additionally, we have helped uh, one of our employees purchase a home. So a big win in our infancy of building this organization, and we have the Mountain Housing Council to uh, thank for the creation and, and birth of this important organization. Awesome. Thanks. Did I miss anyone? Did anyone else want to? Want to speak here for this? Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your hard work and for providing us with those great updates at the last minute like that. That's wonderful. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Stacy to discuss where things are at with the regional housing implementation plan rollout, which a lot of folks here have been anticipating and excited about, and to lead our group discussion for input and feedback. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tara. <clears throat> And thank you, Steve, for being um, on point to help me through this presentation. If you, if you want to jump in or if my cold medication has uh, managed to make me forget a, a portion of this. You sound I, great, Stacey. Thank you. I'm coming in strong. I've been, I've been saving myself. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that this capacity building reflection exercise in lieu of our normal storytelling 
was an important moment for us to just recognize that, you know, number one, TTCF never wanted to institutionalize um, Mountain Housing Council in a way that if we are, if we are um, in the way of progress in any way, um, you know, we can sunset this work. Um, but we knew that there were conversations that needed to be had, um, coordination, alignment, relationship building. Um, and that there were just, you know, there were people who were very passionate about the topic. There were organizations who had within their own mission a focus on housing. And a lot of them felt alone, like they didn't have others to really work with. And so this idea of convening the regional partners to come together and figure out how to advance it um, was really important at the time. We structured the first kind of iteration of Mountain Housing Council as three years. We're now in a second term, if you will, of three years. Sometimes we refer to it as 2.0. Um, and the primary goal of 2.0 was to really focus us on implementation. And so implementation in the way of the first 1.0, you know, Shauna and I used to joke that it was really a lot of myth busting. We think it's the impact fees. It's the impact fees that are preventing it. So we run off and we create a tiger team to look at the impact fees. No, no, no. It's the short-term rentals. It's the short-term rentals that are the problem. And so we ran off. We thought, you know, there really is no silver bullet. There really is no one problem that if we could just fix it, it fixes everything. And so we have to look at the solutions as a constellation of solutions or a portfolio, if you will, of solutions. And it's just something to really acknowledge as we roll out this implementation plan for you um, that a lot of capacity has been built in this region. We have new staff members within agencies. We have new organizations. Um, and a lot of the people that you just heard from are really the core housing focused leaders in the conversation. And then you have kind of cascading partners who also have built capacity within their own organizations. I think about what the resorts have been doing to help with housing of their own workforce. I think about the chamber's desire to engage in housing. And so we continue to see people really raise up and want to continue to build more housing. And as we provide you with this implementation plan, there are some elements in here that are kind of no-brainers, and there's other elements that I think we get to chew on as a region and determine, you know, are these the things that really carry out implementation? I will tell you that as we looked at what is traditionally called a regional housing action plan, and you see action plans, you can look them up. Our RFP team, made up by many of the people who you just heard from, looked at case studies of action plans from other similar communities and what we learned is that an action plan is really looking at all the different programs, incentives, and policies that support a community's housing programs. And it's often an inventory of those things that have been adopted by typically one jurisdiction. The complexity starts to get into the way when you look at, well, we have Placer County who has an action plan that they submit to the state for their housing element. We have town who does the same, Nevada who does the same. And so by combining all of that inventory, that's just the beginning of what implementation looks like for our region and all the muscle that we've built with these different organizations. And so I wanted to frame our conversation around this idea of capacity that is now at the table that wasn't there five years ago and how the team of Sierra Business Council and EPS came together to really rethink how do we move from the traditional action plan that you see in regional communities and provide tools for implementation. I love how Placer talked about their toolkit and what we're providing you with what you're about to see and hopefully you've been seeing all along because we've had stakeholder groups and technical advisory groups and community meetings, like there's been plenty of times as along the way, a report in our Mountain Housing Council the whole time. Um, I hope that now what you're about to see is just that very high level consolidation and an invitation to review it if you haven't yet. 
ask questions. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the time to walk through the elements, not in detail, but high level so you can see the elements. And then we're gonna open it up to a group conversation. We opted to not go into breakouts, but to really let everybody kind of weigh in on a reflective discussion of kind of where we're at and what we think that this means next to us. And I don't know that we'll really get to any solutions, but the mountain housing town, the mountain housing, what am I talking about? Mountain housing council is here. Our staff is here to really listen to what get, is brought up during this discussion as a guide for us in these next few weeks, marching to the next one. Because here's the other thing that you should be thinking about as we present this. We are halfway through 2.0, believe it or not. There are literally, what's half of, there's 18 months. So is that six meetings? Yes. There's six meetings left of this group that we've committed to. And so the question is, what is the highest and best use of this amazing network of organizations who've come together to continue to build capacity, align resources, and provide leadership to this conversation? Okay, so with that, I'm gonna share and jump right in. And um, I guess actually before I do that, Steve, my partner in crime on this one, did I cover some good framing and is there anything I left out before we jump in? No, I think you nailed it. Okay, well, interrupt me if I just get going and okay. don't stop. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, the elements of the plan really, <laughs> this is my cold. It says four parts, but then there's three parts and I apologize. But um, what you got is the, the renewal of the housing needs data. The last time the data was done was in 2016, as you learned. It is not easy to pull information on a region like ours with unincorporated areas of two different counties, a corporated area of a town, uh, or an incorporated area of a town. And then the data lag that comes with the census, um, the challenges of disaggregating data based on um, racial equity <laughs> that is now very much at the forefront of everything we do. Um, and so that was a big piece was to make sure we figure out how we can pull our data more frequently, not only update it, but more frequently. The next piece was this idea of that housing inventory, which we kind of, yes, that's great. That's part of that traditional housing action plan that we see in other regions. But we thought we could take it to another level and we introduced this idea of pitch sheets where we look at site-specific areas and how we can use that inventory to inform developers of potential resources and incentives and limitations of those sites in a more maybe user-friendly way of looking at a site that also engages the community. So we bundled that up in, in what we call the AHA process. And then finally, we start to kind of conceptualize an entity that might serve as a resource for creating housing readiness in partnership with our regulatory entities, the jurisdictions, the developers, and the community. So those are the elements and deliverables that we really focused on over the last year once we got going. So you've all seen this. We presented it last time. We now are proud to tell you that we have a housing updated numbers, but it's updated to the last census. So, you know, on the heels of this, it's time to update it again. And I'm so happy to tell you we have a methodology to do that and a plan. And I think Mountain Housing Council can, you know, come up with those resources to do that. But ultimately, we need to make sure that our region holds a space for aggregated data across the jurisdictions on an annual basis. In addition, that needs to be disaggregated by race to ensure that we're also looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is another kind of part of on the heels of what you're seeing. There's more work to do around the data. The data is messy, it's expensive, but it's an important element for everybody who is in the capacity of housing focused work to have at their fingertips. Um, so there we have that. And we're just really proud that the team 
came up with a methodology that is going to allow for that to take place. Um, at the basis of this AHA, Achievable Housing for All, it begins with what we've learned as Mountain Housing Council partners. We've learned over the years that it gets really difficult to create housing, number one, if the de developer doesn't have the right entitlements and doesn't fall within the jurisdictional kind of regulatory um, partnership that is required. Um, you know, and also if the community isn't engaged and in, in co-creating what fits, what makes sense, and is aware that too many years go by, that, you know, that we don't let too many years go by when decisions get made and the new developments um, come up, even with it, if it's if the development is within the guidelines of the entitlements at the public level, if the community's memory isn't there and we haven't kept them engaged along the way, the community will feel like maybe something um, is disconnected from what they thought um, should be coming to us. And so there's a community readiness, engagement, and education that is necessary. And then the developer. The developer needs help. It is really hard to navigate 17 special districts and all the kind of ways that you have to manifest um, housing. In addition, it's expensive. It's not just expensive in California. It's expensive up here, um, not only, you know, with impact fees if you're talking about multi-units, but, you know, snow load. And the time it takes when there is a lag is more financial resources required of the developer. And so, you know, creating readiness among all the different stakeholders was really the beginning of the conversation of how to get our arms around a process that we could approach at a regional scale. And so we kind of flipped it and, and looked at, you know, could we create a toolkit and a process that aligns these things and focuses in, in exactly what I just shared, um, helping with, you know, the jurisdictions and, and a developer navigate site selection and due diligence, helping a developer navigate incentives financing, um, and then ensuring that the community is on point and undergirded through the whole process. And so I'm happy to tell you that part of the deliverables um, is a consolidated um, Excel spreadsheet that focuses on the different action tools. So this is your traditional action um, uh, plan tool that you would get. And so we have that. And for the first time, we have it across all the different jurisdictions of the community. It will be upon some agency of, of some collaborative, if this is a value, to keep it up to date. Because every new program, every new incentive, every new policy needs to be logged into this. What is the value of having this in one place? Well, it makes it faster and easier for somebody to help a developer navigate those potential opportunities that could make housing more available. Um, and so we have this. Um, it is a very uh, dense spreadsheet, and um, this will be in the hands of our jurisdiction. So it's, it's, it was built and for all of us, um, but ultimately it's up to us to keep it fresh. And then we have this pitch sheet concept. And we know that the jurisdictions do their own parcel planning um, site uh, uh, documentation. But this is really more developer focused to help them understand the process and to engage them at the right moments and to ensure that they're going through and you know the jurisdictions at the right time. They're thinking about the right types of incentives and policies that could impact a certain land, a piece of land, and engaging the community at the right time. And, and what you'll notice is we started with working with the jurisdictions on what do you, which pieces of land do you think are most ready for achievable local housing. And by working with them first, we're working with the experts who know which ones are ready to go. And we're able to kind of adopt the site work that they already do. We're able to then also look at that 
housing action spreadsheet and apply different incentives and financing opportunities that might be available for the developer. And what we see is could our community identify, let's say, 10 targeted sites for achievable local housing that could be um, a work plan, if you will, for us as a region for the next 10 years. And so, you know, this is really where the inspiration came from developing a more publicly facing pitch, pitch sheet, if you will. And then finally, looking at who would manage this annual data pool for the region, who would manage the um, ongoing tracking and development of the actions across all those jurisdictions, who would support a developer through that process and try and guide them to pieces of land that our community and our jurisdictions have identified um, to make it easier to make those pieces of land happen. And so here we, we start to build the framework of a hub. And in this, you can see kind of a continuum where the Mountain Housing Council now hands off this implementation plan that there is an entity or a series of entities. Maybe it's multiple entities that make up the hub. Um, and they then are able to guide projects through and perhaps ready them for the, the limited amount of community capital available that is coordinated and waiting for the kinds of projects that fit within the vision of achievable local housing and hopefully get some resources that will help make the housing um, uh, come into fruition. And so this is the framework that um, we can see the elements of capacity or work that could be engaged at this level of a housing hub type entity or series of entities, the collective. Um, we have walked this around the community. We've engaged a technical advisory committee made up of a lot of you. We've engaged a broader stakeholder group to guide us along the way. Um, so hopefully none of this is surprising. Hopefully nobody's saying, I still don't get it. And if you don't, this is your chance. Um, but, you know, we have had some really great input from different stakeholders around the community as we've really unveiled what we think is a more robust implementation toolkit, if you will. And I think that's it. So before we go to that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Steve, just to round out anything I missed in this presentation, and then we'll open it for discussion. Um, great job, Stacy. especially considering that you're doing it uh, under the weather. <laughs> um, I, I think there were a lot of interesting takeaways from this project, but here's the biggest one to me, that Mountain Housing Council was originally formed to catalyze community collective impact on the housing issue. And going all the way back to that original formation of the Mountain Housing Council, and the data that came out of the needs assessment showing a need for 9,500 units, it's really apparent that um, the jurisdictions cannot do this alone. Like they have, they have, they have made huge, tremendous project pro progress. And like I define our jurisdictions in the statewide groups we participate in now as amongst the most progressive, forward-looking, and engaged jurisdictions on solving California's housing crisis that we see anywhere in the state. But even with that, it's going to take a full effort of the community to put a significant dent in that 9,500-unit deficit that we face, right? And I think the real concept behind the regional housing implementation plan was how do we move from the initial work of the Mountain Housing Council to define the problem, define the issue, to bust the myths, to identify the need, and to set goals to implementation. So this is kind of a watershed moment for this entire effort, in my humble opinion. And now we know what we need to do. And we need to set the goals and implement the policy and the plans and the technical assistance and catalyze community capital and do all the rest of the things that are necessary 
in order to put a significant debt in that 95 hundred number. And it's going to take all of us working together, all the good work you guys described earlier this morning, in order to achieve that objective. So we need to institutionalize that process. And I think that's what that housing hub concept is intended to do, right? We need to build the mechanisms for applying community capital so we can leverage funding from outside the region to help us solve our problem, right? And, and we need to become the place where within the housing community, people know we can go there and we have a welcoming community that wants to work with us and building housing and is going to bring resources and community support to the table to make it happen. Like we need to be the place where housing happens and people know that they have an infrastructure to support their goals in building projects and meeting the, the cohorts that we need. That's kind of the watershed moment we're at right now. And that's very exciting to me. And I think it's a tremendous accomplishment of the Mountain Housing Council. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so with that, I'm going to ask a series of questions. Um, and thank you to some of my colleagues who helped me shape this, this part of the discussion. It really unlocked a lot here for me. And this is a ref this is really encouraging some reflection and some feedback at this moment in in the context of what we're talking about here. So my first question to ask this group is: What stands out, and what surprised you? And I'm going to take some notes. Um, so I'm wondering if Christina, well, she's probably taking notes. Tara, are you available to call on people as they raise their hand? Sure, no problem. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So what stands out, what surprised you? Okay, Shauna, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, so what stands out is seeing the application to the pitch sheets. Um, I, I've, I've looked at it multiple times, but to see it all come together um, in that um, product is something that I think um, if we had the capacity to do that on a lot more parcels would um, really inform both the private investment from a developer, but also in the conversations that I have in my role with those developers. And so um, I know we've talked a lot about those pitch sheets, but to see them all together um, was just um, stands out for me. It, it, I guess in summary, it stands out to me is that we're at a different phase. And I think Shauna Pervine said this, which is we really are getting to that on the ground um, bricks and mortar and, and, and project level. So it's exciting see the stack of the, the, the um, land use planning with the policies, with the incentives. Um, it's just really exciting. Great. That's great. Thank you. And I'm just going to stand out. I'm going to put a link to some of the materials that we sent out with your quarterly packet. So you guys can take a look at uh, what Stacy's talking about kind of in real time for anyone who's kind of a visual Any other standout um, comments or surprises? Uh, this is Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi. Um, I just wanted to go back over the last six years and um, just an overreaching thing. I think the biggest standout to me was the overreaching difficulty to get through planning and such, and because we, we really brought pictures and, and terms and numbers to it. But then the standout is that we are all able to collaboratively get together and solve these issues. And so that would be the biggest surprise, I guess, too. So I think that I commend this whole process for showing the problems, but showing the answers. Shauna, did you have your hand up again or was that from previous? 
think it's probably previous. Um, I think it's previous. Claire has her hand up. Okay, go ahead, Claire. Um, hi, I what stood out for me was the housing readiness triangle showing the three stakeholders of community, developers, and jurisdictions. And I really responded to that question next to community of what do we want to be? And I just want to lift up that that kind of um, awareness of community conversation and visioning is extremely important for however we're able to house all our neighbors and live up to our vision of community. Um, that, you know, it surprised me that that question showed up there and it made me very happy to see it. Thanks, Claire. I've pasted the executive summary into the chat box if anybody just wants to kind of take a quick look. It was sent out with your quarterly packets as well. Okay. Um, are there any other standouts or surprises? I can I can move on to the next question otherwise. All right. The next question is, what questions or concerns does this raise for you? Um, I'll I'll jump in. It's okay. I'll raise my hand this way. <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> figure it out. Um, yeah, I you know I, I probably just a concern is kind of the ongoing ability to kind of maintain the the information. I, I think probably the positive side of it. I love the information. I, I like the. I like the graphics of it. I like the simplification of it. I think we all have many conversations with developers. Um, or potential applicants that are wanting to do projects and um, you know it can become noise at some point and we feel like we're repeating ourselves a number of times but you know they're they're just trying to absorb it so where we can meet people at the, where they're at with graphics and simplicity and those I think is great um, I I think my only concern would be going forward is maintaining those um, particularly as jurisdictions move in different directions to do different things. Um, and so, you know, that would be something that if that kind of started to fall, um, it could just cause a lot of concerns or you know, communication breakdowns with those developers going forward. But so I guess I was both kind of a positive and a negative on those. Can I get, um, can I get clarification on that? Um, specifically, would you be referring to annual data on the housing needs, the pitch mm -hmm. sheet? agreements and the housing inventory collectively captured is that kind of it would be the latter it's the it's the pitch sheets and the um and the inventory just you know maintaining those and keeping them up um with so many moving parts with the local jurisdictions i think is that's going to be a challenge not an insurmountable challenge but nonetheless a challenge right because you're saying that if we were to identify 10 parcels across the three jurisdictions in 2021 and say, these are the opportunities, limitations, incentives, and programs that could be used on this, this parcel that the community has identified. And it's got all the right entitlements and utilities or all the things that you've identified that make it the right kind of parcel for achievable local housing. You're suggesting that maintaining those pitch sheets will probably be um, an ongoing thing. Like you couldn't next year or two years from now necessarily assume that that pitch sheet is the same, has the same things related to that parcel. Is that correct? Correct. And as 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 developers come in and we think we've got the perfect pitch, um, we'll learn things as we talk with them and we'll need to continually update and, and refresh and, and fix that. Um, in addition to just the moving parts of the local jurisdictions, updating our codes and our ordinances and doing all of those things. So it's, it's, it's just, that's, there's a lot to, to take in. That's so helpful to hear. Thank you. All right. Others, Dave, then Hillary. I think it's Dave, Shauna, then Hillary. I think Shauna still has hers up from before. 
So I think it's just oh, Dave. Okay. <laughs> okay, Dave and Hillary. Okay. Sure. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm going to bring up maybe a, a couple of things here, and I'll I'll try to be as brief as I can. So first and foremost, on on the pitch sheets, I, I really like the concept. I think the concept of them is is fantastic. Um, seeing, for example, though the example provided in that executive report, um, both as an elected official but also potentially as a uh, as maybe a neighbor or somebody else, um, they can be really scary. So I, I think that while they're very opportunistic and inspirational, they also need to be grounded in reality and they can't sort of usurp some of the input and processes that are already going to be in place, right? Like we don't have those kinds of parking um, incentives or anything like that yet. So how does, how does, how does all of that going to line up at the end of the day? And, you know, I, I definitely saw, you know, step one was, you know, engage the neighbors, engage the community on all those pitch sheets. Cause, um, I think when we're looking at such aggressive goals like that, our biggest, um, risk is very much going to be, um, potentially with our neighbors and and our other community members. So I just feel like there's going to need to be a balance there of of when those pitch sheets become available, how they're available, are they publicly available, or are they more you know behind a gate at some point? Um, and then how do those also layer on top of the actual jurisdictional issues that we're still sorting out? Um, so that's sort of like point one. Um, but I like them. I just feel like they, we need to figure out what the order of them really is and how they fit in the bigger picture. Um, that sort of dovetails into number two, which is sort of feels like a lot of this work is still falling on the jurisdictions themselves, primarily the town and Placer County. Um, and we just have resource constraints, right? So aspirational and inspirational thinking is, is amazing. All of this work is amazing. Um, but we simply don't always have the capacity to be moving all of this forward, both in a human sense, but also in a financial sense. So, um, you know, how are we going to galvanize the capacity to be addressing these issues? And, you know, I did hear Stacy or Steve said 10 years, you know, that's, that's great. I mean, I think 10 years is actually realistic. Um, and I don't, and I think, you know, layering unrealistic expectations is only going to set us up for, for challenges. Um, and then my third pitch is, um, you know, and Stacy, I'll, I'll use this moment to bring it up here. But I think that there's a real opportunity. Um, sorry, I think that there's a real opportunity right now in the private sector to galvanize interest. And I was really pleased to hear Chris from the chamber step up um, an hour or so ago because that's really refreshing um, for me to hear. But I still feel like there's a huge lack of sort of organization um, and and an input from the private sector. I think we're at a tipping point, as Steve said. And if we're really going to capitalize on this, geez, I apologize, too much going on. Um, if we're really going to capitalize on this tipping point, the private sector is sort of ready and willing to step up. And, and I feel like sort of being left behind or not really knowing what their place is or not knowing how to engage in an effective way. Um, and then sort of having other competitive things happening. Right. And, and, you know, and we're friends, right. It's friendly competitiveness, but when you have, we were on a call yesterday with visit Truckee Tahoe and there's a private business was trying to buy a house and rent a house up in Tahoe Donner and got outbid by the JPA. So, you know, what is this landscape going to look like at the end of the day when we have a JPA and we have a lot of public entities moving some of these things forward? You have the private sector screaming for solutions and sort of not a lot of layering or, you know, there's, there's, you know, you've got Palisades Tahoe, you've got a couple of large employers here, but really sort of, um, missing that sort of medium to small business entity as well. 
So those are just um, a few of my observations, concerns, and potentially opportunities to, to move some action forward in the next year and a half. Thank you. Sorry, I just want to say, Steve, I wanted you to just have a chance on how the site selection was a very delicate dance in this whole process. If you want to just weigh in quickly on that. It was indeed a delicate dance, Dave. <laughs> and, and I think um, I, I think what it, it is not the intent of the pitch sheets to get ahead of or actually act in lieu of public process. As a matter of fact, the pitch sheets clearly state that. What they're really intended to do is act as kind of a tool to engage the developer in possibilities of what might be possible within the region. So I am sensitive to your comment that we need to think about metering the use of those pitch sheets in the process so that they don't get ahead of conversations with the community. But I also don't necessarily see them as um, um, solely a tool of um, the local jurisdictions for outreach to the development community. I think this is actually a key role of that, of that housing hub, right? And that like having a professionalized organization or set of staff outside of the jurisdictions who can actually work directly with the development community to balance community vision, which is incredibly important as Claire said, with um, the aspirations of of the development community so that these things are more baked and ready when they come forward to the jurisdiction. A lot of the heat is taken out of them. The controversy is taken away from them. There have been early discussions with neighbors and surrounding businesses about what the regional impacts or benefits might be, right? Community benefits that the entire community desires could be incorporated earlier in the process. It's really intended to get that that, that kind of um, use, right? And I would see these pitch sheets being done. I fully support Stacy's idea of let's do 10 next year. Um, let's do 40 or 50. Like the reality is we have a lot of opportunity sites that if we could clearly articulate a community vision of what is desired there and match it to the cohorts of housing we need, we have real opportunity on, right? But uh, while I have the floor, I also want to just quickly address something that Shauna said. I, I, I think the, the product that we delivered to Mountain Housing Council gives us the ability to update the community survey on an annual basis. Um, I think a key activity of that housing hub is going to be keeping that tools matrix refreshed on a regular basis. Like that is a really important tool for applying all of the different um, programs to individual sites that would make them more ready for, um, you know, more housing ready, right? And I think the updating of the pitch sheets is an ongoing thing too. So I think Shauna had a really important um, point here that there needs to be investment in the capacity to actually make that happen um, so that that information is fresh every <laughs> time someone comes to the table. But thanks, thanks for your input, Dave. And um, I think it really good. It helps us improve the process. Um, okay. Thank you, Steve. Hillary. Thank you. Um, I think mine is more of a question, but um, I'm generally supportive of the direction of the hub concept. I think that's a, um, a interesting concept to work towards. I don't think I totally understand the relationship between the hub and Mountain Housing Council. The way it was described, my interpretation is that it's sort of a separate entity from Mountain Housing Council. And I don't think I fully understand why or if it's sort of a, this is phase three that we're working towards in sunsetting Mountain Housing Council um, as it currently stands, or if there's some reason why they would be parallel entities um, at the same time, in which case I think I would need to be convinced of that that's a, the right model. Thanks. Hopefully we're not convincing you and you're co-creating it with us because honestly, um, 
it really isn't about convincing anybody. It has to be about the right partners. You know, I think about it like creating a quilt. We all have resources to bring to that and kind of put it together in the right way that makes sense for our community. And I I think the verdict is out. I think right now we've agreed to spend the next 18 months together and we're looking for the highest and best use of our time to really get us into more implementation. And what this implementation plan does is it provides, I think, a toolkit that um, might make sense to certain partners and not other partners, but from our vantage point and the conversations we've had over the last four years, there's a reason why we focused on these tools, the, the inventory, the data, and the site, um, the site sheets that guide conversations between developer jurisdiction and community. And I think the hub concept um, has to get chewed on now. I think that there's a lot of new capacity in the region. And I think that um, there are still some missing gaps. Uh, there's new conversations happening um, around the evolution of capacity. So we know the JPA has shared today that they're looking at expanding beyond public agencies. Um, uh, We know that Plaster is looking at potentially expanding their housing trust. Um, We know that the chamber is looking at how to engage private investors and TTCF continues to want to drive more philanthropic resources for flexible, nimble local capital to belly up alongside TBID and TOT dollars. So I think this is this moment where the great news is there's like all of this growth and new capacity happening. And we now need to be super strategic in these next 18 months to to put the right energy into the right things. Because as you know, um, Standing up new programs takes time, energy, and resources. Standing up new entities, expanding entities, all these things in a small rural community with, you know, 30-ish thousand of us and as much, you know, existing infrastructure that we have, we just have to be smart and collective. And so I think at this moment, all of that is on the table with an invitation to use Mountain Housing Council as a place where we can hammer through some of those bigger decisions. And so I'm going to move us to this next and last question, which is how do you see using this work individually um, in within your organization or collectively? So based on what you've learned today from the more expansive conversation all the way down to the the regional housing implementation plan itself, does anybody have a way that you've already started thinking about that could be helpful? I think our organization could use it this way. Maybe, maybe you know, listening to somebody who works um, directly with some of the stakeholders that we've identified, because we know community has a lot of stakeholders, developers have a lot of, like within each of those stakeholder categories, we all interface with different others. And so how do you see what we've presented today as useful or a way that you might use it as your, within your own organization or even collectively as we think in the spirit of collaboration? Allison, you're muted. I see you. <laughs> we'll come back to you. I appreciate you jumping in. Um, I, should, I, should I just jump in? So, um, so we bring every time we bring a program to council or some initiative, um, we frame it and sort of how this fits in with both our action plan and our priorities that the council has already set forward. And then also sort of where does this fit in with the regional context? And so I could see us, um, as we do with the needs data already is every single time I present, uh, something it's always in the context of the mountain housing council, um, achievable local housing framework, um, and bridge. And then now, um, you know, we would use this to frame up that 
this action that we're, you know, below market rate housing program fits into the town's priorities, which also fits into this regional housing action plan. Um, and I think that really resonates with our, we have two council members on here, so I'm not speaking for them, but um, we we always want to be moving the, uh, the housing um, ship um, in, in alignment with our partners. And so always to know sort of that we're not carrying the load alone, but like who else is doing what piece of even that program or in, in complementary to what we're doing. And so I see using that to frame up um, this plan to frame up um, how our work rolls up into the collective action. Um, I also think just to go back to, um, you know, we're always trying to link up our work with uh, our state agencies that fund a lot of our work. And so I think they always like to see how we're, our, our work in our own little jurisdiction um, links up and coordinates regionally. And I think having this document and this plan, I, I'm pretty focused on that, at that page that shows the spreadsheet of like, here's what we're going to do. And here's, here's um, all the different partners who are going to take it on. Um, I think that makes them very confident to um, choose us for, for funding. Shauna. Thank you, Shauna. Allison. Can you can you hear me? Okay. I was very quickly, I was just gonna echo what I think Shauna just said, although I have top off. I feel like um like there's definitely a power in collective storytelling. And I feel like that document like kind of gives us all the, the graphics and the information we need to really tell our collective story again, around the need, which we all know, but also around the progress. And so I think about like all the different meetings I attend where housing continually comes up. Again, whether we're meeting about like childcare or we're meeting about mental health or all the different things that we talk about as a collaborative and like out in the broader community. And what that does for me is it gives me like very specific sound bites. And I would just echo what Shauna said about that spreadsheet. Like, oh, this is what's actually happening. And this is what these partners are doing as a collective. And um, for me, like it's just really powerful, powerful information to share with the broader community. Thanks, Allison. Any other comments or questions, concerns? Oh, go ahead, Claire. Um, I'm part of United for Action, the community coalition of faith-based organizations and community activists. I brought the executive summary of this implementation plan to our team leaders. I think that we can be a part of this community piece of engagement, outreach, and education. Um, I'm leaning toward we may have a role to play in unlocking inventory by getting the word out to people who have existing uh, property about how to make them available for workforce housing, maybe giving them toolkits to educate them, and also getting helping link people who are homeless or newly unhoused to the resources available. Uh, but discerning what our unique role here in this quilt that Stacy described, um, I think is very exciting and we want to be part of this opportunity of partnership. Claire, can you just give a quick uh, couple lines on what United for Action is so that people understand what that is? Sure, we are a North Tahoe Truckee Community Coalition of faith-based organizations and community activists. Our areas of focus in our teams are education, advocacy, action, and inclusion. So we try to um, bring this information on larger issues back to the community, particularly through faith-based groups and homelessness and housing is our number one priority as determined by our membership right now. That's great. Okay, <clears throat> maybe I haven't asked the right question to get further dialogue, but if I haven't asked the right question and you just would like to provide a comment or a challenge to the team, um, I think the most important moment here is that if there is something about this that you have questions about 
or perhaps you feel like you still don't get it, that you're using your Mountain Housing Council partnership and representation to, to, to put that on the table, that there's really no, um, there's no question or concern that can't be shared. And if it can't be shared here, that it can certainly be shared with the staff. Emily. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on the Housing Hub really quick. One, we've been talking about the Housing Hub for a long time, the Developer Hub. I know for a few years, many of our entities have been talking about what this could bring to our community and the benefits of having one one entity or one place or one uh, collective that's looking at technical assistance programs, accessing capital, et cetera. Um, as I look at it, one, there's excitement thinking around the need for technical assistance for our developers, the need for access and capital for our small businesses, our public agencies, our individuals, all, everyone in the community. I think the one question I have um, with the housing hub is, how do we make sure that we're bringing something that isn't um, duplicative of what our other entities are doing? And it'd be really interesting to engage in an exercise with some of the housing entities that are already working on this to talk about what is everybody doing? How do we make sure that we're bringing to the community something that isn't repetitive and what is already being done? How do we also potentially take some of the, um, the weight off the shoulders of our entitlement agencies to help further housing solutions for the region? So to me, the conversation on the housing hub is an exciting one. How do we move forward um, to further evolve this concept so that it works for the region and all the entities that are already doing um, so much for housing? That is it. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you. And I think that is truly on the mind of, of us as staff as well. Um, and I think Hillary's comment about, well, what does this mean for Mountain Housing Council? I will, I will say that implementation is not our strong suit. Um, you know, I think we are really more about the, co the collaborative convening, supporting the conversation. Um, and I think that something else is going to have to be in place to get to the level of technical expertise that's required on this implementation phase that we're in now as a region. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a need to convene and keep an eye on what's going on, but it might be, you know, somewhat different. And beyond three years, that's what we have. Um, so I think the, du the duplicative, not not, um, yeah, not duplicating services is going to be a real theme for this next quarter. Um, Steve, and then I see John Falk has his hand up. Yeah, I think I, I think Emily raises a really good point, and that it's absolutely critical that like part of our next step here now is what is the actual plan, the business plan for the hub, right? And you know what what are you know what are its areas of work? What are the staffing needs? What are the We've already started working on some of that stuff, but you know that is that is really a critical next step. But I'll just give you a personal observation from providing technical assistance to three separate developers in the North Lake Tahoe Truckee region, where we've been providing some of these services through our Small Business Development Center and our technical assistance uh, program through GoBiz. That um, working directly with the individual developers on really understanding the ground, the politics, the agencies, the process, the funding availability, the adjustments that might need to be made to a project to make them more desirable, the outreach to community and neighbors. This is a highly labor-intensive process. Like, each one of those three, we've probably spent, you know, over the last nine months, a minimum of, you know, 250 to 300 hours with working on those issues alone, right? So, um, you know, this is a this is a very unique role, and it requires kind of an uh, an intermediary who really understands the community and all of the players and how things really get done in a, you know, in a local and a small community. But, you know, with that said, I think um, it is really important that it not be duplicative. 
you know, that in it, the reality is, as I said at the beginning, it's going to take probably five, six, seven different like efforts in order to, you know, in order to address this problem. What, what Stacy said at the beginning, there isn't a silver bullet is indeed true, right? So we need to make sure that we're all working in the right area in order to coordinate that work to get the goal achieved. So Emily, I would really like, I, I look forward to that conversation about what is the next step there. Thank you. John. Thank you. Um, the, you know, I've been doing this full time for 29 years and I've been saying for all that time, the provision of housing is incredibly complex, more complex than most people think. And this process, if nothing else, has aired out and actually added a layer of complexity that even I was not fully aware of. And so it's, it's been instructive even to me, who's worked in the field forever. And um, I was very pleased to see how the group has morphed from, I, I remember for years hearing that, you know, fees and impact fees and all that and exactions were the reason that housing was unaffordable. And then having the Mountain Housing Council, you know, look at it, give it a fair, honest appraisal and say, no, it's a cost, but it's not, it's not outrageous. It's in line. And then, you know, STRs, that's the problem. And then have a group look at that fair-minded, say, no, you know, it's, it's part of the mix. And then we've just gone through step through step and taking some of the, the rumor and innuendo out of, housing and get to the core meat of it, which is that it's complex. And up here locally, and this is the point that I wanted to drive, um, up here locally, we can't depend on state and federal funding because as we're seeing with housing that's already uh, developed, that's trying to provide housing for you know 60%, the very low income housing, it's difficult to find those people because even to live up here, you have to make more than that to survive. And so we really need to make sure that we reemphasize that we're going to have to do some community-wide, region-wide solutions that don't have the entanglements associated with state and federal money and all the restrictions, the HUD restrictions associated therewith, so that we can actually provide achievable housing to the people that need it. Thank you. Awesome. I think that's a great um a great comment to end on and I have a couple takeaways and, and one of the takeaways is a mapping exercise with some of the core agencies to really look at where, where capacity has been built, where it's heading um, and how we make sure that we're aligning towards, you know, a good implementation plan that we can feel good about uh, uh, using these tools collectively. I also think to John's point, you know, we're handed some regulations related to the subsidized housing that, you know, Truckee Artist Lofts and others, um, you know, utilize those tax credits and those grants. And we find ourselves really challenged because so much of our workforce makes more money than what, what those subsidies require. And so I know there's been conversation about, number one, not ever not prioritizing, that was a really bad sentence, sorry, but, you know, to always keep our eye on our lowest wage earners. Like they really do belong, you know, at the heart of this conversation and recognizing that the subsidy type housing that we do need um, is very limited and doesn't really address the fact that so many of our workforce members don't qualify for those and still can't afford to live here. And so I think that's a that's a more philosophical and potentially state and federal policy focus that we could take in the next 18 months just to, you know, maybe put a, put a, shoot an arrow out there um, from as a small mountain community that is, that is trying to work within the parameters of those, those public dollars and, and where we see that challenge. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everybody for the robust conversation. And I want to thank Steve and Ashley. And everybody, the entire team that came together for this regional housing implementation plan, it was a significant lift. Um, so many of you who participated on the technical advisory committee for the stakeholder working group um, to getting the word out to the public uh, meetings that we needed you know, input. I just 
want to really take a moment and honor um, the tremendous amount of work and collective lift that it took to get here. And so thank you with that. And now in these last final minutes, I want to open it up to any um, public members who might want to share uh, any thoughts. And we've put and, up the uh, the protocol. Everyone here is always very respectful, but just to remind yeah. folks about the public engagement protocol. Are there any public members of the public who would like to share any reflections from today or, or comments? Gosh, it's hard to believe. Um, okay. So then I will close this out and uh, encourage you as members of public to continue to stay engaged, to sign up for our newsletter, to attend our next meetings, to look at our website. And then for those of you who give your time and energy and institutional backing behind this work, thank you so much. Um, it feels like you know we've come a long way in the five years since we did that first needs assessment. It feels like the work we do is never fast enough when we know our own neighbors, our, our employees, our businesses, our schools, all of, all of our community is just feeling the weight of, of so many community members who cannot get a foothold here or who we've lost to other areas. And so, you know, it never feels like it's fast enough, but it's still important to know that there's a group of people some who wake up every day and focus on this, and we're grateful for that, and some who within the, the already busy days of what they do um, for their own livelihood and within their own organizations have made this a priority to show up and, and participate. And we're just lucky to have a community that cares that deeply about this work. And there's more to come. So this is our last quarterly meeting. Of course, we're gonna see you all in all of our working group meetings and other things that, that pop up. But I want to just wish everybody um, happy holidays. Uh, if you go to a store with your masks on, you will see there's holiday stuff coming up. So I won't see you. We won't see you till the new year um, officially as Mountain Housing Council. Um, so just wishing everybody a safe season and just looking forward to more progress ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Work. <laughs>